Welcome. I am calling the order of this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, February 27, 2023. I'm Select Board Chair Leonard Diggins coming to you perhaps for the last time from Select Board Chair Command Central because I plan on returning to the chambers uh, next month's meeting, next meeting. Next meeting, and I'll now confirm that all members and persons in persons and participants on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diana Hahn. Affirmative. <laughs> John Hurd. Yes. Steve yes. Corsi. Yes. Eric Helman. Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Steve Sandy Clore. Here. Doug Hahn. Here. Ashley Meyer. Here. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, signed into law on July 17, 2022, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation until March 31st, 2023. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening that do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the notes agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. So, it's a packed agenda, but we're going to do our best to get it all done by 11 o'clock because we have agreed to end our meetings by that hour. The first item on the agenda is the town is an update on the town manager search process. So can we bring in um, Mr. Lynch? Mm -hmm. Good, Good evening. Hi. Hi. So, so um, colleagues, we, you have gotten a, a, a memo from, from um, Bernie, and, and so um, Bernie's just going to give a quick little summary of it, and, and then we'll ask the um, town council to give us some further words. Mr. Lynch. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for uh, thank you for having me. I wish I could be there with you tonight, but uh, um, uh, I have I. The reasons we are all doing this by Zoom has affected me now, so I'm I'm here isolated. But uh, I did uh, I did want to give you an update uh, based off on the work of the screening committee over the last uh, couple of months uh, regarding uh, the town manager search. It, just to give a, a to, you know an update to the board and to the public that's watching uh, exactly how this process has proceeded. Uh, you know you may recall that it was back in late November that we uh, actually went out into the market. We've been working with. The board and with the department heads and members of the community leading up to that to try to identify the uh, qualities that we were looking for in a, in a town manager and the issues that are facing the town of Arlington. And um, uh, with all of that in hand, we uh, developed a position statement, a position profile that uh, we utilized to uh, go out and find candidates uh, for the town. Uh, the board uh, approved that uh, and we began the, the real process at the beginning of December. Uh, and in my letter, I, uh, I indicate the, um, the, the process that we use to go out and, and find those candidates. Obviously, we, we posted in a number of different locations that uh, people that are interested in being a town manager would look to, uh, the Massachusetts Municipal Association, the International City and County uh, Management Association, which covers the entire nation, uh, the Women Leading Government uh, Organization, uh, which uh, is uh, a relatively new uh, component uh, in the municipal world, but one that uh, uh, hopefully will be successful in bringing more women into the municipal management uh, market. Uh, the Boston chapter of the National Forum for Black Public Administrators, uh, engaging local government leaders, an, a re again, a relatively new organization of younger, uh, more diverse um, uh, uh, individuals interested in working in local government. Uh, we heard from the board and we heard from members of the community uh, to asking us to look beyond the, the, uh, the traditional candidates. So we did post the position in the Massachusetts nonprofit network. 
Uh, we also reached out to various public administration programs across the Commonwealth, uh, which again represent not just people interested in working in uh, local government, but people that have uh, had an interest in working in other forms of government or other levels of government, as well as the, the nonprofit sector. Um, in addition to that, uh, we utilize a, uh, a contact a database of uh, over uh, 300 uh, individuals that, uh, that we're familiar with. Uh, most are members of the Massachusetts Municipal Management Association, the town managers, town administrators, uh, and uh, assistants uh, across the Commonwealth. Uh, we provided them with notice of this uh, position uh, through, uh, through contact uh, through our database. Uh, as well as another of other number of other people that have signed on to be notified of this type of position as they become available here uh, in in the Commonwealth. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, we did active recruiting. Uh, we went out, we talked to about two dozen people that uh, we thought would be good candidates. A number of those people did, in fact, uh, make the decision to uh, apply for the position. Uh, of course, a number of them chose not to as well for a variety of reasons. Uh, but um, at the end of it all, uh, you know, we felt that we had a, a good pool. Uh, we had uh, 20 people that have uh, actually applied for the position, which is about consistent with what where we're seeing most of these searches uh, that we've been doing over the last uh, uh, several months. And obviously, we've been doing this for about eight years now, um, searching for town managers, town administrators across the state. Uh, but, uh, you know, I pulled up some numbers uh, in preparation for tonight's meeting, looking to see exactly what we had in other communities that are, are nearby that we've done within the last few months. And Arlington's numbers are were, were relatively similar to what those other uh, communities uh, had found. Um, I thought we had a strong pool. I think the screening committee felt that uh, we had a good pool of candidates. Uh, I had identified uh, up to 12 individuals that uh, might be considered uh, good candidates for interviews. Um, there were a number of those candidates that had, uh, you know, uh, backgrounds that, uh, the committee was very interested in, uh, and there were some others that, uh, they were less interested in with additional discussion and research. Um, but we moved forward, we interviewed six candidates for the, for the position. And, uh, the interviews took place over two days, uh, in the deep, in the, uh, the letter that I've sent you, I've, I've provided you with a, uh, a little summary of the, the types of issues that we discussed with the candidates regarding their style, regarding their specific skills, regarding their ability to build relationships within the community and outside of the community and how they would work with the board. And we put all of the candidates through a, an exercise where they provided us with a presentation, uh, both written form as well as uh, uh, an oral presentation uh, as to how they would uh, move forward on a development of a strategic plan to deal with the development issues uh, facing the, the town of Arlington. Uh, I think the committee, uh, and I, I know I felt good about the, the candidates that we had to, to bring forward to you. We had identified four candidates uh, for advancement to the board uh, and, um, you know, giving them notice that they had been selected and that we were moving forward to bring their name to the board uh, tonight, actually. Uh, we had anticipated that this would be the night. Um, over the course of uh, a period of time, uh, th three of those members, uh, three of the candidates that we had selected uh, for one reason or another um, made the decision to actually withdraw from the process. And it stayed, it's, uh, it's for a variety of reasons that they have given me, uh, and, um, but generally it's, they just didn't feel that this was the right time for them to be um, looking at the Arlington position, um, given their current, their current uh, positions in local government. And um, so the situation that we now find ourselves in is that we have one candidate remaining that, um, and there's, there's questions as to how that should be handled, uh, given the open meeting law and the manner in which the screening committee uh, operates under that open meeting law. And, uh, you know, we, we need to decide or the board needs to decide uh, how they want to proceed. And I, I've had some discussions with council and uh, I know that council is prepared to uh, discuss this matter with you tonight uh, and we can look at uh, look at these options. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. And so I'll turn it over now to Mr. Hine. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to reiterate one piece of this, the process is sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, a screening committee is required to recommend more than one candidate. But on the other, the privacy interests of candidates who wish to withdraw from consideration are well protected in the law. In short, the screening committee did its job developing four recommended candidates, but it cannot publicly identify three of them, leaving us with only one public recommendation. This office did reach out to the Division of Open Government, which is, does not have a precedent for this exact situation, and our options are essentially twofold. One option is to reopen the search in a different manner without the screening committee. Um, there's a number of different permutations for how you could do that, but a screening committee isn't required. Um, and obviously, uh, some information has been gleaned from the efforts, the fantastic efforts of the screening committee to date uh, that would help potentially steer it in a different direction without the screening committee. A second is to formally write the Division of Open Government, describing our circumstance and seeking any comment or concern that they have such that the board can proceed with confidence that it's done everything it can before utilizing a single public recommendation of the screening committee. That might involve uh, disclosure for in-camera review of the folks um, who were recommended, such that uh, the public and the Division of Open Government can have confidence in, that those recommendations uh, were in fact made and that it's beyond our control that uh, folks withdrew from consideration. <coughs> but again, I want to make one thing clear. I, I, I can't promise an outcome from that particular process because I have not seen, um, nor is the Division of Open Government um, presently aware of an exact precedent for that circumstance. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. Okay, so I just want to make it clear, I'm not expecting a decision uh, tonight. I mean, I know this is a lot. I mean, and so so um, we can discuss. I mean, we don't have to make a decision one way or another night. Tonight, we'll just have it on the agenda um, for our next meeting, and we can you know, discuss the next meeting and decide to make a decision or not in that next meeting. So at this point, I will um, look for questions, comments. Mr. Corsi. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, th thank you, Mr. Lynch and Attorney Heim, uh, for the background information. And, and as I understand it, as I, from the, the, the memo and from the presentation tonight, um, in, in understanding the law, as Attorney Heim has, has, has laid out to us previously, the search committee had, had the four individuals accepted going forward. At, at the moment, the search committee selected their four candidates. Their job was essentially done, and at that point, they handed the names over to Mr. Lynch to contact the candidates. Is, it, is that accurate? Yes. Okay. All right. And, and I, I understand the need for, for confidentiality, and, and I, I did have a brief discussion today with Attorney Heim about some different scenarios. And, and clearly, had there been only one name that came out of the process, there would be a problem. Um, I view it, and I'm looking forward to hearing from my colleagues, but where there was four names selected and there's an opportunity to seek comment from the Division of Open Government, um, I'd almost be inclined to do that because we, we laid out this process, there was an interview process, there was a selection process, and now we're at that point where you're balancing the privacy rights of the individuals, whether or not they want to go forward or not. Um, with the need to be conduct final interviews in, in, in open session. And it just seems to me that, that, that where the committee had done their work and at that point they had made their selections, um, I'm comfortable with the work that they did. You know, we, we entrusted them to do that work and, and I, I'd look for a comment from the Division of Open Government um, because of the, the one thing that does concern me is, is if we just simply went forward and then we were ordered later to release the three other names um, that that might be unfortunate if there was some sort of violation. But I think, I, to me, I, I, I would, um, we can think about this, but I, I'd be inclined to, to seek that comment. Ms. Mahan. <clears throat> um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with my colleague, uh, Mr. DeCourcy, um, on everything that he stated in terms of the process and how we got here and where we are. Um, I just have a couple of questions. And since this really 
hasn't been done before, at least not in my memory. We've been in a situation, a position like this. Um, so if, if, uh, if I could, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask town council, if possible, recognizing <laughs> we've never had to do this before, so we don't have any anecdotal history to, to fall back on, but if the board so chose, which, as Mr. DeCourcy has stated, which I agree with, um, to uh, contact the Division of Open Government, um, do you have a guesstimate? It's, it's okay if you didn't, if you don't, in terms of once we get the necessary uh, notification um, to the Division of Open Government, what a sort of turnaround would be. Mr. Chairman, yes. thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. It's an excellent question, and unfortunately I don't. So if it was a complaint, there would be a more sort of structured timeline for our response and them to issue a decision. This would essentially be describing a situation to them and asking for any comment that they have on it so that we could try to be as transparent with both them and the um, public. Um, my experience as the Division of Open Government has been uh, very good about being responsive to community's needs, um, but I, I couldn't promise the time. Okay. <clears throat> what I'd like to do, but I want to hear from um, all of my colleagues on the board, is um, I'd like to move forward with, um, unless there's something else that I, I'll agree to <laughs> right now, um, notifying the Division of Open Government, um, outlining the process. Um, I understand from town council's remarks the other three candidates who were semi-finalists and, and were going to be finalists will have their names uh, not redacted but in camera, meaning in chambers only. And we don't know if that situation, or do we know that that will be the case moving forward or because this hasn't been done before, we may have to um, unredact those names and make them public. If I could ask Attorney Heim that, Mr. Yes, Chair. yes please. Uh, I'll give it some thought, Mrs. Mahan, but I think what my initial instinct would be would be to provide redacted versions identifying them as candidates mm -hmm. one, two, three, and four, and then if the division seeks that information, just so they're not carrying the burden of having that information, having to redact it themselves or something like that, if they seek that information saying, I'll give you the identities of these folks, but I would want to proceed with the utmost caution with trying to make sure that we protect the privacy interests as outlined in the law of persons who are seeking the job, but trying to make it clear, like, here's the recommendations, here were the votes, here were, here, here's the process and how they came to these four folks so that it's not, so there's no question that four folks were presented. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that they actually necessarily care exactly who those four folks were, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll probably try that way first mm -hmm. and then say, if you'd like further information, thank you for uh, translating that for their internal review only. Um, I, I think it would be appropriate to provide it to a government agency charged with making sure that um, local government is, is transparent. Okay, and, and I appreciate that because I want to, as we all do, treat everybody fairly uh, in terms of uh, whatever their reasons, and I don't know what they are, and, and if I need to know in the future, I will, uh, but I'm not asking. Um, I also want to respect the fact that they're professionals from either another municipality or perhaps a village, or I'm saying for people outside of Massachusetts, you know, it's called village or something else. So, but I'd like to um, hear from uh, Mr. Hurd and, and Mr. Helmuth and, and then the chair, I guess, sort of as a wrap up, but I'd like to proceed forward that we uh, notify the Division of Open Government um, and then hopefully after that get some response back from them and then move forward with the uh, remaining finalist, conduct the interview, and then decide if um, that's going to be our next town manager or not. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Thomas? I'm sorry, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd. What happened is my, I, I lost my screen. So, 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 if it was Mr. Hurd that went next, Mr. Hurd. Um, yeah, I don't want to reiterate other than I, I guess I should just say ditto to previous comments. But, I mean, I think we went through a process and we, 
put people we trust on the screening committee and they gave they selected four people and it's not any of their doing that three of them decided to withdraw their names from consideration and at the end of the day if we don't like the candidate they put forward then we can at that point go back to the drawing board we don't have to choose the person that the screening committee is putting forward or the leftover person that the screening committee is putting forward so I would like to proceed as Ms. Ms. Mahan and Mr. DeGorsi said. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a question, Mr. Chair, if, if, uh, of you or Mr. Lynch, who could speak for the sense of the screening committee. Sure, sure. Um, is it your opinion that of the four individuals that were recommended to become finalists, um, all of them were strong candidates who were well qualified and, and met the brief that you know that you felt confident in putting them forward. Yes. 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 Uh, I, I would echo from the chair that uh, yes, the, the all these candidates were identified, and, and the, the committee was very uh, very clear on that in their discussions that these were really the only four that these were the four that they wanted. They interviewed two others, but these were the four that they wanted to be considered. Thank you. That's very helpful. I, I think it's really important that that be clear, um, that all of us, the town, the public, understand that this was a good process. This was a robust and strong process, process to be proud of. And I'm really grateful for your work on the screening committee and Mr. Lynch. Um, because you know where we are has nothing to do with with any weakness or defect in that process. I think that I'm, I'm satisfied that it was a you know a good one, as good as it could have been. Um, and it's good to know that the, the remaining candidate is is one that has the full confidence of of the group as as being you know an equally strong and viable candidate. And you know I don't want to penalize that person or or the, the town honestly by uh, declaring that that process has somehow failed because it it really hasn't. Circumstances are just what they are. Um, I do have a question for Attorney Heim. Uh, if we refer this to the Division of Local Government and they were to say, they were issued an opinion that we could not proceed uh, with, with um, the, the remaining single finalist, are we any worse off? Does that close off any of the options that we presently have? Or does it, uh, other than time? obviously, in a delay. Mr. Hart. I would want, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would want to see what the Division of Open Government's base for concern is. Um, obviously, the biggest concern for all of us is that no one wants to make an appointment and have that appointment later invalidated or found that there was something wanting in the process. I think you've well outlined that from the screening committee's perspective, and from the board's perspective, the screening committee was tasked with identifying four finalists. They did that. In the intervening time between the identification of four finalists and reporting those back to you, three of them have withdrawn. Um, and that's an unfortunate circumstance that shouldn't prejudice the town or, 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 or anybody else. So I think that the, it does not alter your choices with respect to deciding to use a different process, um, mm -hmm. something that's not, not utilizing the screening committee's recommendations. Um, I obviously think that there would be things we'd really have to seriously think about if you wanted to move ahead, mm -hmm. despite the Division of Open Government's concern or comment saying, please don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I'll be curious to see what their opinion is on it, and I, I do think it's important for us to recognize that we're kind of dealing with two competing legal um, mm -hmm. principles, yeah. one being privacy of candidates and the other being like, hey, we want to have transparency in the way this decision was made. Yep. Um, so, Understood. Yep. That's very helpful. Thank you. I would just further say um, I also support the idea of, of firing that question off to, to DLG. I was initially thinking when I first heard this that maybe we should just take a breath and wait, but it occurs to me that we can do both that we can ask them for their opinion, and that's gonna take some number of, of days, we don't know how, how many, you know, and that we have another meeting soon, and you know, I, we, can, we can reflect upon that while they're doing the reflection. So I would certainly support that and suggest, if my colleagues are on board, that we consider um, voting to make that referral tonight. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, well, um, we have a consensus here, and I'll just add that you know, it, it really was a pleasure working with the screening committee. I mean, everyone in there I mean, worked hard. Uh, we had we had uh, three meetings, you know, uh, two long interview sessions, you know, and then we had an extra meeting, and then everyone, you know, did um, everyone spoke their minds, I mean, uh, and, and did a good job of, of defending their points of view, I mean, and, and, um, and there was a lot of respect for everyone and everyone's opinion in the group. So uh, from that perspective, I mean, it was um, definitely a successful um, screening committee, I mean, uh, uh, and, and so the outcome is what it is through no fault of the screening committee, and, and um, we, we are at consensus, and I don't think we have to wait in, uh, another week I mean, to um, contact DOG if everyone's on board. It seems like we are, so I guess we just need a motion. Um, I'd like to make a motion <clears throat> to authorize um, the chair and or town council to um, submit it or contact the Division of Open Government regarding the town manager's search process. I second that motion. Thank you, Ms. Vice Chair. Any other comments, questions? Okay. okay. Uh, the motion is a letter to DOJ and it's by Ms. Mahan and a second uh, by Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Hearn? Mr. Hearn? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Unanimous vote. Great. Great. Thank you. So, thank, thank you, Mr. Lynch. Thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you and 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 um and, and Sharon Flaherty. And, uh, and so thank you for all of your work, really, and all of your phone calls with me and text messages. Me, you you respond very quickly. And, uh, and so it's very been very much appreciated. So thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, I, I look forward to continuing to work with the town as we work our way through this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. -bye. So um, now on to the consent agenda. Uh, we have a uh, vote. Um, number three, uh, the comptroller. Tell I'm sorry, sorry. Sorry. That's right. Thank you. So um, so the, um, the second quarter financial report by the, um, Mr. Kohler. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would turn this over to the town comptroller, Ida Cody, if I may. Um, and, Cody. and I know it, in the past, we've presented this in writing, and the members have asked questions. Um, I don't know if we have a presentation. Um, no, 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 I guess we're gonna so, keep the same format. So I'm Ida Cody, the controller. Um, you received the year-to-date budget report for the second quarter. Um, everything is where it's supposed to be at 50%, borderline boring, <laughs> because there are just very few exceptions, and I know that I'm in the narrative part. So um, if you have any questions, I would say that the very first statement under the expenses is inaccurate because at the time I wrote the report, we didn't have a board administrator, and now we do have one. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, other than that, uh, expenses and revenues are at 50% for general fund as well as the O5 enterprise funds. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Cody. In this case, boring is good. <laughs> good. Good question. Move receipt. Oh, yeah. Um, Move receipt. Okay, Mr. Okay. Heard. Second, and maybe a question. Yes, yes. please. Um, I see in here regarding investments, which seem very, very robust. Um, in terms of revenues, is that just sort of a blip anomaly, or is that something you see continuing? The investments, you said. Well, we had a very conservative estimate. Uh, it was only $200,000. Um, also, this depends on how much cash we have in the bank. Uh, we didn't expect the, the rates to go up so quickly, so high, and that uh, determined the spike in the, the investments. But as we are building the high school and the DPW, the cash is going to go down, so we don't expect to have the same spike, the same large amounts in the future. We, that, that's why we didn't even increase it in 2024 significantly. Okay, so um, 
with my just very limited knowledge of uh, revenue and, and budgets, and et cetera, one of the things that I have in the back of my mind is that, um, well, some may see something at 510% is, wow, that's really great, that's really good, but in terms of budgeting and planning, um, that's not something we want to consistently experience. Um, and I'm not saying this is a critique or a negative thing, and if I'm incorrect, please correct me. So my, I guess, question, and then I have an outside question from, from this report. I guess my question would be, um, is, are we a bit too conservative when it comes to um, this particular revenue item? And if so, are we examining that so that moving forward, um, and, and, and I'm not being disparaging in terms of the 510%, but just my basic core of budgets and finance, um, that's something you don't want to have consistently because that could be interpreted or misinterpreted that somebody isn't budgeting appropriately and could have followed down the line. So I don't know if Ms. Cody or the town manager actually got my question in there. I'll, there I'll just make a small comment and then I'll let Sandy. Uh, this was a total anomaly. If, if you look in the past two years, we were right about a, a little bit higher than estimate, but this year it was a lot more just because of what happened to the interest rates. I, I would agree with that. And we, we've looked, we look back, I, I have a spreadsheet that looks back 15 years at what the history of this, this is. This is far and away the largest number. And I think as Edith said, you know, we borrowed $75 million for the high school. We borrowed, I forget what the last tranche was for the DPW. It means we're sitting on a lot of cash and interest rates going up. That's, in the future, that's really not going to be uh, to those same extent. So um, I don't think we're going to see numbers this high. I would, it would be my recommendation going forward for the town to keep the revenue estimate at 200000 um, and I think in the future you'll see the actual numbers coming back down. Uh, I hope something slightly above that because we do want to be conservative. Mm -hmm. But um, this is, I think, really a one-time uh, excess amount of revenue. Okay. And, and I only raise that point moving forward. And I know um, perhaps tonight or future meeting we will have conversations around override if it's needed, when it's needed. Um, just in terms of uh, when we're doing that, just in case somebody kind of picks out this and says, are you not budgeting right? Or so that we all have the information that this really is an anomaly. The town manager, the comptroller have looked back 15 years. We're not being super, super conservative. We're being appropriately conservative. And unless as you go through the budget process, you decide to move it a little, and I'm not, not the person to make that decision. Um, I just wanted to, when we, I don't want to say if and when, I want to say when we go for an override, um, when we go out there and tell people that, you know, we've looked in every nook and cranny um, and, and, and done what we can do to whatever that number is um, when we reach that. And then just an outside question, if I may, Mr. Chair. And sure, I just, please, please. just need a brief answer. Um, I know at the uh, Powers and Sullivan audit meeting, opera funding was discussed and a mechanism was described in terms of oversight of that and tracking and ensuring with the U.S. Treasury Department, federal government, that the town through the Comptroller and Powers and Sullivan is tracking and reporting the opera monies appropriately, um, taking aside the long range planning of opera funding, which does have a, a time deadline, it's, it's not going to go on forever. Um, besides the um, audit meeting, which traditionally just happens once a year at the beginning of the year, um, what I would like is when the town manager and comptroller think is an appropriate time, I mean, it could be the end of the year, um, maybe not fiscal year, maybe calendar year, just sort of a reporting to the board um, in, in, in terms of opera funding, um, and uh, the reason I raise that is uh, one of the things I'd like to see is if there are of the positions that opera is funding, um, that it's a position that when the money runs out, 
if we have to make a decision that that position runs out, which is sort of the guidance that we got from the federal government. Don't use the, these monies for that particular category. Um, but I do see a few positions in there um, that, you know, I'd just like to uh, get some information on that. And then I'm just going to, along with my colleagues, keep beating this drum in terms of, um, I guess I would ask the town manager, could we have <clears throat> before, before um, or by June 30th, a concrete decision regarding uh, COVID for the, our retirees. Um, I know Representative Gob Gobbley highlighted some monies that he got uh, in addition to that sort of fall under that. And I know myself and my colleagues have had conversations with the former town manager and current town manager. I just feel like that's just been hanging out there for so long. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see that resolved and it did. to my understanding they're really the only group that has not been compensated and I'm talking about retirees who hadn't yet retired and were working for the town during COVID um, I, to my uh, queries they're, they're really the only group that didn't receive any reimbursement for working through COVID um, all the unions uh, our management M schedule, et cetera, have. So with that, that's my question. If I could, Mr. Chair, to the town. Yes, yes. That's fine. Uh, I would be happy to put together a report. I, in fact, met with the comptroller and with, with several department heads last week to just review their spending to date, um, to see how much they're on track or and what um, their future spending requirements will be. Um, and it is has definitely been my intention before I leave to make a recommendation to the board about all the issues you've talked about. Um, so uh, yes, I promised to give you a report and to make some recommendations. And um, today I will leave it at that, but I will follow up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to move receipt of the 2023 second quarter financial report. Second. Thank you. I, 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 I guess, my motion. Yeah, yeah so, so I was about to say, I, I thought that Mr. Hurd had made the motion. So, so we'll stick with Mr. Hurd making the motion. And Mr. Mr. Mahan is, is making the second. So that's fine. That's fine. Hey, it, it, it had been a while. I mean, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Trust me. You know, uh, so uh, anyone else want to say anything? Okay. Okay. Um, so I have the second. Uh, uh, so, so okay. I'll, I'll just add uh, that I, I understand the question about the um, the, the 510 percent uh, increase in investment revenue, and I had a conversation with uh, uh, the manager, town manager, this morning about it. So that's why I don't have a question about it because my my concern really was if this was all related to interest rates, uh, I was concerned about the impact on debt, uh, uh, and so what that might pretend in terms of impacting the budget when we have to issue more debt. Uh, but the town manager did explain that it is because we are sitting on a lot of cash related to the schools, meaning that kind of compounds uh, this this um, this increase mean in, in, in revenue. And this, I hate to say this, only 200K, you know, but it is easy when the denominator is that small, you know, to get a high percentage um, increase. So I'm confident, you know, in the way that people are approaching uh, that. So. So, um, no more comments. We have a motion to move receipt of the report by Mr. Hurd and a second by Ms. Mahad. Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Ms. Mahad? Thank you for that fine motion, Mr. Hurd. Yes. yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. 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 Mr. And, and, and thank you, Ms. Cody. I know you were ready to go like a month ago, so I appreciate your patience on, on waiting to do this report. All right. Thank you. No thank Take you. care. Good night. Good night. Good night. And so now, for the consent agenda, and I get to read it off a big screen. You know, uh, so the four, we have a vote authorizing police detail in and in person early voting for the annual town election on April 1st, 2023, by uh, Ms. Brazil, Tom Clark. Number five, a request special one day beer and wine license on March 11, 2023, at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a private event as Howard and Cherry Brzezinski. Six, a request special one day beer wine license on March 25, 2023, at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for Beats for Eats fundraiser. Andy Duane, Project Eats executive director. And number seven, 
for approval, Boston Women's Market at Whittemore Park, Saturday, June, sorry, sorry, Saturday, May 6th, and July 22nd at 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's Carol Lafretta, directing and organizer of Boston Women's Market, and DJ Borgard, our economic development coordinator. So with that, uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I move approval subject to conditions um, including the recommendation for details by the public safety departments on the uh, item six and seven. Second. Okay. okay. So on a move uh, for approval subject to um, um, the details that Mr. Helmuth laid out and uh, second uh, by Mr. Hurd and Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mr. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. yes. <coughs> okay. okay. On words to number eight, licenses and permits. And uh, so first we have uh, for approval wine and malt license and common pictorial license. Thai Sticky Rice, 1377 Mass Avenue, uh, Naraman, and I'm going to give this a try. Uh, Jen Kitz, Jen Kitz, Gerard Incha? No, I really, I, I did better when I was practicing it myself. So will you uh, please tell me um, how to pronounce your last name and how you like to, uh, how you like to refer to you, call you and trust you. Can you, hear, can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. Good evening. My name is Daniel Briansky. I'm an attorney in Boston, and I represent the uh, <clears throat> the potential licensee, uh, Thai Sticky Rice Inc. Uh, we're seeking a uh, transfer of a uh, beer and wine license for the premises located at 1377-1381 Massachusetts Avenue in Arlington. Yeah. So I will turn to my colleagues. I'm trying to find my notes. I thought I had a. Okay, there you go. So um, I'll turn to my colleagues, please. Any questions, comments, or colleagues? The, the uh, by uh, the way, the manager. If I could interrupt for a second, the sure. manager, the proposed liquor manager, is a gentleman named uh, Christopher Raza, Riza, and uh, he's he's had uh, at least ten years' experience operating a restaurant and being a liquor license manager. Thank you. Uh, question for the applicant: Can you describe the uh, policy and the and the plans for server training for alcohol license server people will be serving alcohol in the establishment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. As, as I uh, just alluded to, uh, Christopher Rizza is uh, the proposed liquor manager for the uh, corporation. He's had ten years' experience. He's operated the predecessor uh, licensee, JJSU Family Inc. And uh, he's, he's been doing this for 10 years. And I, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the, the, uh, the town has had no problems with, the, uh, uh, with him or the prior, uh, our predecessor. Thank you. I, I think my question was specifically, uh, will the licensee be utilizing the state provided ser required server training for all employees who will be serving alcohol. Yes, yes. we will. We will do that. Yes. yes. Okay. I would move approval subject to that and any other conditions contained in the memos. I'll, I'll second it with a question. Yes, Ms. Um, is Mr. Rizza with us tonight? That he could um, 
I, I'd like to hear from the actual person that will be mm. sort of overseeing. I, 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 I believe he is. I believe he is, or he's supposed to be. If you could just hang on one second and learn. I hope console. he hears me and he can he can come on. Yeah, he he has his hand raised. He's being promoted to panelist now. Okay, and my question would be, um, when we've had. Uh, 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 managers before us when there has been an issue in terms of uh, someone being served that should an underage um, it's usually been uh, where you know we, we can get the standard boil boilerplate in terms of you know the manager is gonna oversee this has you know 10 15 20 years experience in it but then they get hit with the especially in the current employment climate out there in terms of uh, really trying to find uh, enough people to work at any type of um, vocation, but especially in the restaurant business. And usually when there's um, a violation that occurs, it's when, you know, the manager's not there and the person who's sort of his or her right-hand person also isn't there, and it goes to a brand new employee who's had little or perhaps no training, and that's where the violation occurs. So um, I'd like to hear from the manager uh, how he would, uh, handle that scenario, and besides himself, how many other uh, potential servers are TIPS certified and or any other training that um, he deems appropriate? Mr. Rizzo? If that's okay. Yes, I'm here. Yes. yes. Sorry, I was, um, I was trying to figure out how to talk on this, but while the question was going on, um, I know um, it's been me and my wife who run the restaurant for the last 10 years. Um, we've had a couple of um, couple of employees as well that we've trained. Um, basically, um, you know, we went through the beer and wine license training um, through the, um, I think it's the TIPS program. There were a lot of great ideas in that. And um, we've kept a, a book or a notebook on premise of uh, any incidents. Luckily, there have been none to report for the time we've been with the restaurant. Um, and um, just basically the same training that is provided by TIPS is the same training that we also provide to the um, other two waitresses that were there full time or are currently there full time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Did you get a second? I don't remember. Did Mr. Hel if Mr. Helmut's motion has not been seconded, I will second it. Any other questions, comments? Okay. So, on a motion to approve the license and for, um, excuse me, for Thai sticky rice and uh, by Mr. Helmuth and a second by Mr. Han. Mr. Han. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Hahn. Yes. Mr. Jenkins. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, and thank you for doing business with us. You know, it's a it's a nice location in the Heights, and uh, I wish you all success. And I look to checking it out soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, members of the board. Good night. So. So next, uh, we have uh, another uh, common pictorial, li pictorial license in um, Boston Pizza and Giro, 1323 Mass Ave, Ismael Piazzas. I would just ask if someone would raise their hand. I don't see his name, but I'm not positive if he's under a different name. If you would just raise your hand and see if you were here. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Mr. Okay. All right. Well, um, maybe they will come to our next meeting. And uh, so we'll go on to number 10 and for approval, a class two license, Boston Art Exchange. And um, Boston Art Exchange, LLC, 19 Park Avenue, Anthony Pazil. Here, yes. Hey, how's it going? Can you guys hear me? Hey, fine. You know, so I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. But in any case, yep. just tell me how you want to be addressed. Yep, Anthony Basili. Um, I'm originally from Winchester. I grew up right down the street from the location. Um, so I'm here seeking a class two license. 
um, a little background about me and our business. When I graduated college, um, I worked for my father in Boston, where we did auto repair and used car sales. And we were there for over 52 years. Um, we left that location after our lease was terminated um, due to a development in that site. And we had the opportunity to purchase the piece of property at 19 Park Ave. And we are very grateful and hope to provide the same service that we did in Boston to Arlington. Um, Mr. Um, Chair, I'd like to move approval and um, sort of be redundant because I know the applicant, um, Mr. Bayatsis, and I apologize if I haven't said that correctly, is certainly aware of, um, in terms of storing the uh, vehicles, I think you've applied for up to six. Is that correct? Is it up to six? That is correct. Um, that uh, and we're all familiar with the site. Uh, you certainly have the, the space there to do it. I know some neighbors in the past sometimes have been uh, concerned about if the uh, sidewalk, the public sidewalk gets blocked. But I've been by that business quite a few times. You've certainly um, opened up the space and, and made uh, available use of it. So I just wanted to note something that you're already aware of and you're already doing in terms of um, where those up to six vehicles, along with the vehicles that are in there for repair and or vehicles that are in or out. But you, you certainly, from the many times I've driven by, are, are managing that traffic and parking flow appropriately. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hartner. I'll second the motion. So I think your predecessor was a well-loved guy in town, but I think everybody is probably breathe a sigh of relief to drive by there and see that the the uh, area had been cleaned up and is a little less stressful, even I think to drive by. <laughs> so um, it looks like you're doing a good job there, and uh, look forward to seeing you flourish in the town in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, yeah, courses? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yeah, just a quick question for the applicant on the materials that were provided to us from the town departments. The um, the right of way was attached to that. And and is there any issue with where you're going to park cars with the right of way, or is or is that not interfering with that? So we looked. Um, we had a closer look <clears throat> with a plot plan done a couple of weeks ago, and it shouldn't interfere with the right of way. Um, if it was to, we wouldn't obviously put cars there. Um, so we would do our best to keep that open. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and to echo Mr. Hurt's comments, say, yeah, I've been by the site recently and you've done a nice job, um, since you've taken over. Thank you. Questions, comments? Okay. So I have nothing to add to um, what's been said, and so, so I think we're going to be happy to uh, give you approval as, as soon as we vote on the motion by Mr. Mahan and, and the second by Mr. Hurt to um, accept this um, So, Mr. Hurt? Mr. Hurt? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Mr. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Dickens? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on to traffic rules and order. Number 11, we have a presentation and vote Mass Ave's Appleton Street intersection redesign. So, Mr. Corsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and consistent with when this has come up previously before the board, I will be recusing myself um, from, from any discussion or vote tonight. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. So we have um, Stantac Consulting Services. Yes, good evening. My name is Ralph Dennis Cohen with, with Stantac. And there Thank should you. be a presentation. Would you like me to? Yeah, sure. Well, one second. All right. Thank you very much. I'm Claire Ricker. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development here. 
Um, we're presenting um, an update to you guys tonight, to you folks, about um, the work that we have done on Mass Ave and Appleton Street following the 2020 um, fatality of Charlie Proctor on his bicycle um, by someone attempting to make a left turn onto um, Appleton Street. Um, for years, the intersection had been recognized as a troubled one, um, an, an intersection of concern. Um, as early as 2011 and probably before that, um, safety issues had been cited related to the intersection, including confusion about flashing yellows or flashing reds, wide expanse of pavement between Appleton Street and Appleton Place, sharp angle of the Appleton Street approach, busy student crossing um, during the Audison Middle School arrival and dismissive, significant solar glare um, that has limited the visibility, um, especially during the afternoon, um, and high speeds by drivers and cyclists um, and transit um, through that corridor. Um, the town retained the Transportation Consulting Services of Green International to install temporary safety measures um, in 2021. Um, the goals of those measures were to prioritize safety in concept design and element, um, to control vehicle speed on Mass Ave, to slow down the left turn from Appleton Street uh, onto Appleton Street from Mass Ave, which, can, well, which at the time could be taken without slowing the vehicle, reduce the number of vehicle conflicts at Mass Ave Appleton, protect pedestrians and cyclists, increase their safety, focus on short-term improvements that can be installed as soon as possible, and they were, um, and to reduce the impacts to on-street parking. So those temporary um, safety measures were installed. They have been in place since about a year after the fatality. Um, but to make long-range changes and improve safety in that area, um, the town um, contracted with Stantec Consulting Services uh, to provide design engineering and public engagement for the project. Um, they were brought on uh, about mid-April, May of, of uh, 2022, 20, uh, um, and we have since been working on um, concept design, public engagement, um, and generally soliciting public comments related to permanent infrastructure uh, changes to the intersection. We had uh, two, uh, two, three, four public meetings. The most recent one was on the 18th of October. This is one I attended. It was a, the first uh, public meeting I attended in this role. Um, and that night was to uh, solicit public comment related to the corridor, related to suggested improvements, concepts that we had put out um, on tables, folks could comment, folks could put post-its, things like that. Um, the same presentation was made the following day at the Audison Middle School to the middle schoolers by Stantec um, so that they could also see uh, the development of the, uh, the design of the intersection and you know, really how uh, this kind of planning and infrastructure work uh, goes on. At the meeting on um, October 18th, we uh, received the joyous news that we had been awarded a $307,000 MassWorks design grant to finish the, um, the design documents related to this project, to bring us from roughly 25% concept design to 100% biddable documents. So we received this grant. Um, and have been heartened uh, by the interest of MassWorks in the project to the point where we would like to, this spring, apply for construction funding for the project. Um, and we're looking for a letter of support from the select board so that we can apply for these funds. We are very, very um, hopeful that we will receive construction funding related to this project because we've already received design money related to this project. Uh, we do think the state is interested in completion, um, and so we are hoping uh, that we can get the support of the select board tonight um, to move forward with some concepts. So what you're going to see tonight is progress to, um, um, to concept level. We are having a public meeting on the 15th um, to, for more comment, obviously, um, and to go over the final two concepts that we've really sort of settled on and have been circling around um, for the last month or so. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Stan Peck and Ralph. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Um, I'll just note that we're joined remotely by two other members of our team, Aaron Cameron and Elise D'Onofrio, who, depending on questions, may be available to answer specifics of, of uh, where we are or anything about the design as it stands. I, Claire did a great job of kind of giving you the background of where we were. We've been at this for a little bit under a year, and I think we're at the point where we're presenting uh, you know, an advanced concept is the right term. 
I think very shortly after the public meeting, we'll take that to 25% design and then to final design, and that's what's needed to apply for the MassWorks grant. And I'm going to say the deadline, and I might get it wrong, but it's, it's, it's sometime in May. So we're really on the kind of fast track to, to get this to the, the next phases. If you can go to the next slide, this is just a graphic of what the recommendations for the short-term improvements were that were implemented. The town has made minor modifications to those even since these have been implemented, kind of on an ongoing basis, just trying to respond to community concerns and adapting to the, the world as it exists uh, kind of at the moment. But what, when we were brought on, the town very rightly, I think, took a much broader approach to what should happen at the intersection, not just at the intersection of Mass Ave and Appleton, but to extend the study area you know, west to, I think it's Richardson, about where the Dunkin' Donuts is, and east past Forest, a block or two to Quinn. Um, so you can really look at not just this one block, not just this one place, but the whole corridor and how it operates uh, within that much larger study area. One of the very first things we did was we took all new traffic counts, pedestrian <coughs> counts, bicycle counts, really good understanding of the activity in the area. I hesitate to say post-COVID, but it was done in the spring of 2022, so things were, were sort of back to normal. And what you see outlined here is just an example, is uh, not an example, but the, that boundary is essentially the, the study area that we looked at. And that study area is not just an area of influence. We have design recommendations for everything within that boundary. So it's not just that we're making improvements or proposing improvements through this process at the corner of Appleton, but really along that, that entire stretch. I'll walk you through some very brief planning, and then I'll, I'll get to the design if you go to the next slide. Again, that, that, that process, as Claire had said, we've had a number of public meetings where we kind of took a step back and not just asked about what do you like about the interim design, but really what do you want this place to be? What are the things that it needs to accommodate? Help us as a design team understand all the things that happen here, all the things that want to happen here, um, and how do we how do we compile those into something that that is reflective of the community's desires? We translated that into goals, uh, which are really the things that we're designing for. In other words, a successful design a design will be successful to the extent it does these things. Uh, these were all vetted through the community; they were reflected back through that process. Um, you know, we have, not just at the, at the public meetings, but through online. Uh, and even in person, I think we've posted things at the library and had people a chance to comment. And very much what you see here, I'm not going to read them all, is it's about balancing all of the various activities that happen in this stretch and doing it in a way that, you know, let's just say previously was much more auto-centered. Here, it's about designing a place that everybody in every aspect knows where and how they're supposed to be and how they're supposed to interact. Can, Can I have a question on that slide? Sure. If I could, Mr. Chair. Could you just very briefly explain under the fourth category, the last one, what is enhanced placemaking? So what we really mean by enhanced placemaking is essentially giving this place an identity, right? So through the design, through the areas that will be created, through materials, the look, the feel of how the area would work, that it would feel more like a place than it does today. Um, and you may, uh, hopefully, that'll come across a little bit as we show you a little bit about what the design's starting to look like. One thing we haven't done yet, because this happens after the advanced concept, you know, we have ideas about, I'll call it landscaping um, and things like that. Those will be fleshed out in the just next phase, in fact, we'll present some ideas about that at the public meeting on the 15th, mm -hmm. um, because you really have to set, you have to set the curb lines, you have to know the space that you're dealing with to do that. And throughout this process, we've reserved the opportunities to create that. Um, if that I hope that's a okay. good I think what I'm hearing is as you move forward, you're gonna actually point to something that is a tangible, it, just because it says use green infra infrastructure for enhanced placemaking, the select board person to me wants to know um, when church, school, and businesses in that area come up and say, "Well, what does that mean for parking? What, what, what does that mean?" So we'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about parking you. as then well. I'll stop there. I just saw enhanced placemaking, and I had a lot of good jokes about it. But I going to say it. Go, keep going. Sorry. Thank not, you. Not, no problem at all. So, so one one thing that really became evident, you know, in, in 
just looking at the design and understanding how it functions and understanding how the area works, it's really that this stretch of the corridor, the middle section focused on Appleton Street, can feel a little disjointed. Mass, it's at the bend on Mass Ave from both directions. Mass Ave's fairly wide as you approach it. There's, you know, there's not so much traffic so that cars tend to speed as they're approaching the area and all of a sudden you turn that little corner and you're entering a place that feels different. You know, you've got businesses, you've got the schools, you know, you've got residences, you've got a kind of a crossroads of activity here and you don't realize that until you're too late. So you're approaching it in that way. So I think this speaks very well to the town's idea of picking a larger study area and wanting to look at it more broadly because what we're trying to do, uh, I'll use um, you know, more landscape terms, like announce the fact at the edges that you're entering a different area and that it's visible so that as you're driving westbound on Mass Ave and at that stretch that you see at the bottom right of the screen, you will see in front of you that there's this marker, let's call that advanced placemaking, that starts to show you when you get there, you're going to have to behave differently the street's going to work a little bit differently because there's more activity happening over there. And it's the same in the, in the other direction. Sorry. <laughs> no, that, that, that's okay. Um, and <clears throat> some other things as we went through the community process, both that we've identified and certainly that, that folks in the community have represented, are just some of the challenges in the area. There's poor sight lines um, at many of the intersections. They, they hit at weird angles. Um, that leads to accidents, it leads to near misses, I mean near, uh, near crashes. There's very few crossings across Mass Ave, which means people are crossing probably illegally. We've got some numbers on that from when we did our, from when we did our counts. And the short-term design, while it did a lot, didn't really fully address, I think, the full scope of what folks' concerns, concerns were. So we took a very broad and detailed look at this entire stretch try to understand all the various activities that are happening here and find a way to, to accommodate them as best as possible. You can, go, you can go to the next slide. And I'll just talk to a few of them. If you just think about the one block, the kind of core block between Appleton and Forest, you know, folks wanted parking, dedicated bicycle facilities, a left turn lane in each direction, and all of those things require trade-offs because the space just wasn't there to fit all of those things within the existing, and certainly not in a way that you could do it with just paint and sort of interim improvements like, like were done previously. We did a full survey of the entire area. We have to in order to move to 100% design. And one of the things that we were able to do was look at if you could repurpose some of the sidewalk space on the north side of the street, you're able to gain some space back that allows you to make fewer of those trade-offs, right? So try to put as much as we could of the things that people wanted within the right-of-way without really sacrificing, you know, anything that was, that was kind of absolutely critical. We still need to meet minimums. We still need to be safe. We still needed to do all of those things. So by repurposing part of that sidewalk space, we're able to create separated bicycle facilities on both sides of the street retain parking uh, where, where really it was most critical, which is on the north side, on the business side, to allow for left turn lanes and retain street trees, in fact, add new ones in certain places, um, and still maintain really more than adequate sidewalks um, you know, for, for this area. So that's, that's part of what we came. I just talked about preserving important parking. There is some loss of parking that comes with the trade-offs of what's, what's happening here. But we worked very closely to make sure that we were preserving it in the places where it was most important, where it was most used, where it's in front of the most active uses. Uh, so we did that kind of throughout the corridor. We can go to the next slide. And then this is the, the final concept. And again, some slightly modified version of this will get slightly better. Uh, we're continuing to tweak it. It will be what we present on March 15th. Uh, and this is working from west to east. So that's Richardson Avenue by the Dunkin' Donuts there. You see where Lowell Street comes in. One of the things that, that's being proposed here is really I'm calling it teeing off Lowell Street, whereas today it kind of hits at a very oblique angle. It's a lot of asphalt and it's wide open. Kind of turn it a little bit at the edge of the foot of the rocks 
and create some plaza space. You actually get some more space at the foot of the rocks there. Uh, when you do that, I, I won't read all the, you know, the little notations there, uh, just for the sake of clarity and, uh, and time. You can go into any of them if you need to. But it shows you what some of those, what some of those improvements are. You'll see again, bicycle facilities, a sidewalk level on both sides of the street there. Driveways are being preserved, parking, you know, in this case in front of the, uh, the apartment building there. Um, along this stretch, some additional crosswalks, some bump outs, which both help pedestrian crossings to help with sight lines, to help with safety, to help with reducing speed, uh, kind of in and around each of, these, each of these streets. The next slide just takes this further east. And here you see where Appleton Street comes in. Um, the alignment of Appleton Street doesn't change much here. There's some minor tweaks to it. We're adding a signal with a left turn lane. This will be a full operational signal, not just the, the blinking facility that you have there today. The left turn lane from Mass Ave westbound onto Appleton Street. And what you may notice here is what we're proposing is uh, essentially closing off Appleton Place to general traffic. Um, they would still be accessible for emergency vehicles. We've worked with uh, the fire department, police department, and others to, to go through this. We'll obviously keep working with them through the design. So you'd preserve emergency access, but you'd eliminate kind of just general vehicular traffic at this stretch. Um, and, and just to your question earlier, you know, you can see some of that added space are opportunities for placemaking. In fact, the church is actually excited about the idea that the area around this could be hesitate to use the word like more iconic, but you, you can create more of a plaza feel. You can create a different kind of sense of what that feels like um, at that location. And if you can go further east, and we'll go through this, um, just some examples of kind of what that might look like. We call them precedent images, things that are have been done in other places that are similar to what we're trying to achieve here. I'm sorry, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, and then when you get to Forrest and Burton, this intersection would also be signalized. Far Street has as much, if not more, depending on the movement traffic as Appleton Street does. Um, the left turns from Mass Ave onto Forest Street can be pretty heavy. One thing this actually does as well, it solves a lot of problems that, that folks in the neighborhood to the south of Mass Ave um, have said is it's very difficult to get out of their neighborhood and having a signal at Burton Street. So now at Burton Street, if you come out, you come out at a traffic signal, you get a green light to be able to turn right or left, whereas now you're coming out at kind of a blind angle and you're trying to force your way in to make those turns. So we think that's a real amenity for folks. Again, you can see where some of these, the bump outs are. If you can imagine that those would be visible much further back, it really changes that your, your perception as a driver about how you're approaching the area and that this is a place you're going to need to pay much more attention to all of the details of. Uh, and then again, it, it extends out to Quinn Road, where you transition back to essentially what the rest of Mass Ave looks like at this location. So that's the concept is, again, we're, we're moving pretty fast now. It's taken a while to take some of the, the more key decisions here. We'll present this back to the community in a couple of weeks, and then the hope is to go to 25, 75% and then to apply for that MassWorks grant and, and, and hopefully you know, achieve the funding so that this can move into the construction phase. I think maybe there's like a, no, that's it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Mr. Hart. How did you publicize the public forums? Because this was a shocker to me. I, I didn't know we had any public forums on this. I didn't even know we had a design that was in process. I mean, we've done them in a number of ways, and Claire, I know we've worked with uh, the town's public information folks. I forget what the terminology is. We've kept lists of the folks who've attended uh, the meetings before. Uh, we've posted it at the library. I believe it's been posted online. Okay. So, I mean, I, there's all kinds of good stuff here, but to be honest with you, I find this infuriating. We went through this process, and I mean, I, this is before you were involved. This is before Ms. Ricker was with the town, but we we had multiple meetings that talked about different design content, and this board rejected taking a whole stretch of parking out from across these businesses. 
And I know that there's people in town that say, we say, well, we don't want to do this. And they say, oh, yeah, but we want you to do this. And we say, well, we don't want to do this, but, yeah, we want you to do this. Um, but we had sort of a sort of a bananas parking study that was done. We, we wanted a parking study that was done just for that specific stretch. And then there was a parking study that came to us for streets in front of my rack, for like side streets, and just kind of spaces that weren't really feasible for the businesses that were there. We, this was all came to play in response to a fatal accident. And we had sent this to create the committee to cre create a design that would stop that and would prevent those fatal accidents from happening. And I think the design we came up with addressed the problems with the no left turn. And I think this design addresses that with the lights. And I think the lights are what are going to pre present these fatal accidents and the real injuries um, from happening at this intersection. Uh, the, I think we need to go back to the drawing board here and just figure out how to, at the time, we had talked about the parking and originally we were presenting with a plan where the parking was taken out. We rejected that and we reworked it to try to get the best of both worlds. And I had actually said, let's take some of the sidewalk because we have a big sidewalk there. And there was only so, so much feet that was presented to us at the time that said that we need this in order to get bike lanes on both sides. That was the concern is that they had bike lanes on both sides. That's why they want to take the parking out so we can get bike lanes on both sides. And I think if we take a certain percent, percent percent of a certain amount of the sidewalk, we can get that. Um, I, j I know some of the people that had spoke with us at the time, I mean, just the businesses are not their concern, and that's fine if they don't care about the businesses, but the business that we heard from the businesses pretty dramatically, even in the, in the concept that we, are, that we designed, that we adopted, that was a sort of compromise I still heard from the businesses that they were going to be negatively, negatively impacted. So it is kind of irritating to have this come back to us after we, this board said, had really took up this issue before. And I mean, again, I like everything about this, but I think they need to rework the designs so they can have parking on both sides because there's a lot of businesses, there's a lot of restaurants. I use the restaurants and I park on that side of the street. And otherwise, I would have to figure out a way to loop around. And I mean, that's my two cents. I mean, I, I feel like we've already gone through this issue. And to see it come back is just irritating to me. Should I respond? I mean, I can respond just, just, just yes, about sure. the design process. Sure. sure. I, I, I think you, you reached the same conclusion we did about widening the sidewalk. I think we had the benefit of the survey and the more detailed information to allow that to happen. All of the choices that are reflected in this design were presented through that process. They were, you know, we, we've done some coordination, the town's done additional coordination with the neighbors, with the businesses about the trade-offs and the ability to fit parking on both sides left turn lanes, adequate sidewalks, and dedicated bicycle facilities. Something's got to give, right? And in, in this block, something's got to give. And by cutting into the sidewalk, and it's not even the right term, but by repurposing part of the sidewalk, you know, what I think the design was able to do was, was balance all of those things in a way that I think reflected what the community's concerns that we've heard through this process were, um, and to preserve the parking in the places where it's, you know, it's most impactful, right? And that's, you know, this has been a long process for yeah. years, even before we got here, our charge was to think and work on a much, much bigger scale than what the previous process was. And I think we tried to apply that, and I think the design at least applies that in a way that we heard through the process up and down the corridor. And even the parking, you know, sometimes goes on one side or the other side of the street, depending on, you know, where it might be most impactful. Yeah, I think, I mean, this public comment, which we certainly always take public comment and whatnot, but 
I mean, it's also this board's purview to set parking policy, and this can't happen without a vote of the board. And we already, I think, this is a key aspect that we talked about back then, and it's the same board as it was at the time. Um, so, those are my comments. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you for this work and for an excellent presentation. I have a question about the request of the board tonight's letter of support and the timing and the process. So um, I'm glad to know my colleagues' concerns about the parking. I think that's going to be a continuing discussion. Um, I also don't want to lose the momentum to apply for the funding to do this because we clearly need it. And I think I, I appreciate Ms. Ricker's point that um, the fact that MassWorks has awarded a substantial amount for, for design funding is very strongly indicative of the potential to, to get the construction funding. And we certainly have consensus that we need to make improvements to that. One of the things I really like about this is that it doesn't just focus on the narrow question of how do we prevent that particular kind of bike car collision that happened, but how do we make it safer for pedestrians. I love it that you went to Audison because I, I know this intersection rather well, as do my colleagues. We all live nearby, and some of us live very nearby. And you know, if you go there at school dismissal time, it is a concern. Um, just seeing the, the, the kinds of street crossings, the lack of, of safe legal street crossings that you describe, and, and the traffic flow and the pattern into the intersection, despite the presence of crossing guards, um, is, is a concern. So I look at this much more broadly as a safety issue for the kids. And I don't want to, I hope there's a way that we can move forward with this process to keep the funding and design going and keep the discussion about the parking going without losing momentum. The final thing I really like about this is that it takes a neighborhood wide view. Uh, the placemaking is a term of art. Um, and, I've, and I've worked with enough planners through my prior role before I started the, the, the board here. Uh, to understand that that's actually a really affirming and energetic and positive way, and, and it benefits businesses. It benefits the institution, it benefits the church, it benefits the neighborhood, it benefits the residents, because you start opening up a neighborhood uh, to be a place that people want to go to, a destination, identity. At the same time, you do signal to, to the cars and to the pedestrians and to, and to the cyclists that, it's, that this is a place now, and so we do this place differently than we used to. Um, so I think there's, there's an awful lot to like here. Uh, but my guess, going back to my question, this might be from Ms. Ricker or, or whoever knows, uh, is uh, if we were to, if I were to uh, move that we uh, submit a letter supporting this um, at this phase, what does that mean with respect to questions like the parking? Um, do we have the option to change some of the par parking vis-a-vis -vis my colleagues' concerns? Um, meaningfully as we go forward and in, can you kind of describe maybe conversely you know what the timeline is if we are not able to reach that consensus tonight with respect to preserving this this path for the funding to get these good things done yes, yes. I, I think you're I, up I, I, okay <laughs> if you know um, please do <laughs> I, I know somewhat at least uh, yeah. our, our I don't know. Can team. you hear me? I, I can. Let oh. me let me let okay. me start. Let me start, yeah. Elise, and maybe maybe you can Great. you can answer a little bit further. You need to be at a certain level of design, which is I'm going to say pretty close to final design, and have the cost estimates in order to apply for the Mass Works funding for, so, for the construction. For construction, yeah. so some of the decisions I think that would go along with that really need to be made as part of that application. Elise can talk about the specifics a little bit better than I can. You know, I, I would probably venture to say that we're at the point where some of these decisions, you know, how much you can leave open is dwindling as we approach that deadline. And I think the deadline is May. I think the first thing we need June to do is- June 2nd. June, so close, um, is apply for an expression of interest, uh, which is mid-March. And that says that you shall be getting an application for the entire project by June 2nd. Uh, at least, if I missed anything or there's any clarity you can add. No, um, I think Ralph is correct in saying that there is still room to 
obviously work through the design and any concerns that anyone has. Um, I think that window is closing just in order to give us enough time to engineer this corridor to the place of being in a final design, bid ready with an accurate estimate. So that way MassWorks is able to review the application and understand what they are going to be funding. And then on that note, give the town the appropriate funds to proceed. Um, the expression of interest that's due in mid-March, it's um, something they've started in recent years and it allows you to put in, it's a couple page application, kind of as a, I'm gonna call it a heads up <laughs> to what's coming. Um, gives them an idea of the type of project, which they are already familiar with it generally based on the application that was submitted last year. And I feel as though a letter of support for the expression of interest would be that this project is supported and improvements, you know, will be made and want to be made to this area. But the specifics of that could come into play um, and be described more thoughtfully in the actual application, which is due on June 2nd. And thank you. Will this <laughs> board, if we were to vote that support tonight, will this board have another opportunity to approve the final design that's submitted June 2nd that would finalize and lock in the parking? Yes. Would you, come up, <laughs> Ms. Ricker, would you come up to the microphone just so the people on ca cable can hear you? God bless you. Thank you. Yes, we're still receiving comment on concept design through the public meeting um, on the 15th. Um, I have done a lot, of, made a lot of phone calls to St. Athanasius. Athanasius Church. I've been working with uh, Nick uh, Kriketos over there. Um, I've also made some calls to the businesses. I know they are unhappy about any loss of parking. They are happy that we left the parking in on the north side of the street, which is the side obviously closest to the businesses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and on my end, you know, I'm also dealing with, um, you know, folks that are the, the bike ped folks that are really looking for a treatment that is modern, um, state of the art, and really the best practice, which at this point is a um, sidewalk level bike lane separated from a sidewalk. That is the treatment right now that is understood <coughs> to be the best practice in terms of building a complete street, um, making these kinds of transportation improvements. Now, I'm not going to disregard anybody's need for parking by any means, but we are, you know, we're balancing a lot of interests here. Um, certainly the bike peg community, certainly the, the business owners over there, um, the kids at the school. I have been, I, I, I saw that one day, all the kids <coughs> coming out of the school, and I was, it's, it's a lot, you know, there's a lot going on in that intersection, all different kinds of days for all different kinds of reasons. Um, yes, we would bring a final concept, or excuse me, a final concept to move forward with um, to get it to 100% design. But right <coughs> now, if we don't get a letter of support, we couldn't, you know, mm -hmm. we can't do anything. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't do a stoplight, we couldn't do any of it. So whether we scale it up, scale it down, scale mm -hmm. it different, we would still need to seek construction funding for whatever it is we're looking to yeah. do. Thank you, that, that's really helpful. Um, I'm gonna move that we proceed, I'll make a motion that we, that we do the letter of support. And the intent of my motion is to invite you to engage with any members of the board that really need to plug into this and the businesses because we don't have a lot of time between now and Certainly. June 1st um, to, to resolve, you know, to come to a, to a final resolution uh, before you, you know, come back to us for that final vote. My, my understanding is that you need that final vote in order to actually pull, pull the trigger and, and apply. Correct. Then I, you know, I, I don't see reason to slow it down. Whereas if we don't get moving, you know, by mid-March, which is coming up blindingly fast, um, you know, I don't want to lose the opportunity to, 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 to stay on the funding train, frankly. Um, so thank you for that. Um, that is my motion and I look forward to hearing from the rest of my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Any other comments or questions? Ms. Mahan? Did you say Ms. Mahan? You did. I'm yes, sorry. Yes. Sorry, sometimes I hear you perfectly and sometimes I don't. No, <clears throat> no, no. Um, a question, the letter of support from the select board, is that for the March initial submission, the June final submission, or both? I believe it's just for the March submission at this point. 
I don't want to, I don't want to put words yes. in your mouth. Where... I'll, I'll say yes. I, I would say if you were ready to give us one for both, we would gladly accept it. But if we are only ready um, to commit to the March deadline, then that is fine, and we can continue working with everyone on this. I, I think I would be more comfortable with that. Um, so that it would still give this board the opportunity, instead of having the approval be March and June, do March and then have a discussion in whatever amount of weeks um, about June. Um, I clarify my motion to constrain to March, by the way. Is that okay? Yes, that's Thank what I meant. So. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. And um, only because um, I, I think I know Mr. Hurt's frustration in the sense that this board had. Um, couple of very long public meetings besides going out individually, not as a quorum. Um, and I live right near there, right off of Quincy Street. So I could see the Audison from my front side and hear it from all sides, uh, as well as the Greek church and Greek school. Um, and <clears throat> what was before us that there was an awful lot of uh, uh, conversation about in terms of parking and businesses as well as from residents. There was um, concerns about um, bicyclists in terms of, and where I live so close to that, and I'm by that all the time. Um, the speed of cars and the speed of bicyclists who totally ignore anything, the, the minority that do that. I'm not saying all bicyclists do that. Um, they're just as dangerous, you know, if you get, uh, have a crash pedestrian bicycle 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 absolutely we already know bicycle motor vehicle um, so after we had all those meetings um, I know correct me if I'm wrong but Mr. Hurd and Mr. Amstutz from the planning department because the board kind of put on hold because we heard so many comments for parking not just from the businesses but in terms of uh, residents in that area saying you know it's like water, you just gotta move it off Mass Ave on that side into the neighborhood. And we sort of came up with a compromise. So I don't know if you can answer this, but is that, um, uh, I thought that compromise that came up where there still was some loss of parking, but there wasn't the total, um, not annihilation. Um, I've been typing a thing today, everything's exoneration and all that, but. Um, that that compromise that as a result of those public hearings that the board had which there was some loss of business parking on the south side but not the total elimination of it is that it was my understanding that that was okay that's part of the plan and that's what we're designing around and now i don't see that in there i see we're back to the beginning which is where this whole hamster wheel began so, so is there any way we can get back to that I don't want to say hurt him stuff. Compromise, but whatever you want to call it. Well, I, I want to clarify just what's in the design that we, that we presented. It does preserve parking in several areas along the stretch of Mass Ave, typically on one side of the street, not on both. In the case of the area between Appleton and Forest, that parking is preserved on the north side in front of the businesses, but not on the south side. That, varies as you go up and down the corridor as best we could to meet really I think the concerns we heard and the activity that we've seen about where parking is is perhaps most beneficial um, so there is parking preserved this does not remove all of the parking and preserves as much of it as could be preserved within the design and still achieving all the other things that we're, we're trying to achieve everything 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 gave a little bit uh, in terms of all the things that we're trying to fit in here well, I guess my suggestion would be if, if you're seeking a, a letter of support for the final June submission, if you could go back and look at that compromise, which it was my understanding because there was a lot of comments and meetings at this public meetings that this board had and efforts put into that. And I thought that issue was already dealt with and it seems like we're back to square one. So if there's any way we can get if you could take a look at that at that compromise that uh, Mr. Amstutz and Mr. Hurd um, in the previous town manager uh, came up with. I didn't realize, and it wasn't presented to me, that, well, this is just a temporary fix, but when we filed the final plans, we're going to go back to the first thing that had people, residents, uh, students, and businesses coming to a meeting. 
I thought, so I think that's where some of the frustration is. Um, <clears throat> and then, and I'll second um, Mr. Helmut's motion for the letter of approval for the initial uh, MassWorks grant in March, which is sort of giving them the, hey, we we'll expect something in June. And, and the only reason I brought up about the green, stuff, green infrastructure for enhanced uh, place markings, I, you know, I'm a court reporter. One of the places I cut my teeth on is land court. I know what can creep into that, you know. Afterwards when people say, well, how the heck did this happen? It's usually that little isolation right there. And that's why I'd like a little more clarity on that and sort of some tangibles to what that. Because we're, we're gonna face the music, not that you all aren't, but we're definitely gonna face the music because ultimately we, you know, we make that decision. So, I mean, I'm not like a dummy dumb. And as you get to know me, you'll know if I ask a question, I kind of know what I, the answer is and I want to make sure we're, we're all on the same page. And then um, in terms of the, uh, and I don't say that sarcastically or disparagingly, I'm just trying to, sometimes in my effort to be 100%, I always say to people, I'll never talk behind your back because I'll tell you first. <laughs> and then you'll say, yeah, I do know that because she told me. But the other thing is, and I don't know if this is something that, um, it may something, be something that's too soon in the process, has already been um, designed for, and it isn't something I should worry about. But for that particular intersection, Mass and Appleton, Appleton Street Place, Mass and Forest and Burton, for the proposed signalized light signals that you have for those two areas. If there's any way, because of the, I don't know if it's the topography of, of that particular intersection, the only other place I experience it, and I think they did a terrible job, but it's there now, is Mass and uh, stop and shop Highland Ave. That morning so solar glare when everybody's crossing and that weekend solar glare when everyone's going to Greek school and then Greek services as well as the, uh, the children's place, Mr. Her the weekend thing, that solar glare is just outrageous and can we avoid what happened at Mass and Highland Ave? If you're I know you're saying north and south, but when I think of Mass Ave, I think east and west. Yeah. So when you're coming down east towards Cambridge, if you go for that solar glare, which is at its worst at that intersection, but even more worse at Mass Burton Forest, Mass Appleton, Appleton Street Place, especially in the morning, it's legit blinding. Um, the lights that are put in um, at Mass and Highland when you're going east down Mass Ave, you technically have, I'll say two and a half opportunities, but there's three lights when you're coming down east on Mass Ave with solar glare. And in the morning, you just can't, there's two green, opportunity green lights, and then there's a dedicated left turn um, into stop and shop. Even doing this in the morning, the way those, I don't know if it's the LED, uh, lights that are in the signal, I don't know if it's because the signals are all placed pretty much in the same area um, versus sort of staggering them. But my, one of my big fears would be is, which I definitely want the light signalization at the two intersections um, that you cited, but can we um, somehow look into that, accounting for that outrageous solar glare especially in the morning. And then one of the other questions that I had was, and it doesn't have to be answered tonight, but in terms of the final submission, will uh, the light signalization also include, similar to what we did at uh, Mass Ave and Route 660, Mass and Pleasant, um, not only do we have the you know, green infrastructure for bicyclists where they queue to wait until it's time to go. They also have their own dedicated signal. Will there be any or can there be any similar signals for the, which is not gonna solve 100% the issue, just like it doesn't solve, you know, uh, pedestrians that jaywalk or goodness gracious, a dog or cat that escapes from Arlington Animal Clinic and runs across the street. But are, do you plan on having any of those? 
there are a lot of really amazing questions in there. And the answer, I think, to most of them is yes. And if you'll just allow me, I'll, I'll try to elaborate a little bit. One, to the placemaking comments, I would, I would expect that the next time this project is brought before you, some of those, some of, you know, there'll be further thought on those decisions so we can show what that looks like. Um, two, we're very aware of the solar glare issue. The next step is really to think about placement. In other words, exactly where do the signal poles go, and where do the mast arms go, and where do they, and how do they fit, and we'll be cognizant of solar glare and other factors in there. I think there's two other things I want to want to reiterate, though, that I think help address your, your larger concern. One is very much the design that we're showing tells everybody where to be. If you're a pedestrian, here's where you should be. If you're a bicyclist, here's where you should be. If you're a driver, if you're a parker, if you're a walker, whatever you are, it's telling you, and you'll have a dedicated space that'll be signalized and protected, right? So I think that helps a lot with telling bicyclists how to behave, pedestrians where to cross, and by the way, we're gonna give you more crossings than you had before. There'll be, there'll be bicycle indications, there'll be walk indications, and, and, and all those things we're talking about. An exclusive phase for pedestrians, meaning everybody else is red when you're walking across the street. We're designing that in. Uh, we've been working with town staff on that. But the last piece that I think addresses the solar glare issue a little bit is what I was saying earlier. The other examples you mentioned along Mass Ave are on long straight stretches of street. So you, and I've, I've done this, I drive down Mass Ave. You may be six blocks away and you can't really even see the light to know it's there or if it's red or green or anything else, you're trying to watch the cars in front of you. When I talk about on this stretch, designing the edges so that from farther away, you're recognizing because there's bump outs, because there's more landscaping, because it's treated more heavily, that you are entering a different kind of place. You will slow down as you approach it so that by the time you can see the light, you know, you're going 20 miles an hour, not 35 miles an hour. That alone is going to make it easier to see. Right? That alone is going to change your perception as a driver of how you interact with the area. And you couple that with the, the really specific design features. And I think that increases, you know, it increases the safety, it increases the visibility of all, even those pedestrians, as I said, they'll be on little bump outs. So, you know, you're not seeing, you know, you're, you're, 8, 10, 12 feet closer to where the crossing is. You're more visible to everybody. All of that, all those design features help to change the behavior. And Elise, if I'm missing anything on the solar glare or the specifics of the design, please help me out here. I think, I think I've listened to you enough to get most of it. And you're doing great. <laughs> and could somebody add, I think I heard um, you're also proposing two additional crosswalks, one at Mass and Burton, and I forget the other one, so if someone could. Remind. One at Richardson, I think. Um, and it, it should be in the deck that you have there as well. There are three new crosswalks. Actually, we're doing one at Richardson, another at Clark, and then one down by Quinn Road so that we're able to provide enough crossings um, to get pedestrians across Mass Ave. Okay, that's fine. And the only reason I raise that is I know people have come in for requests for crosswalks. And we've been told by state law and the UPMAP, whatever that thing is of road laws, that we had to deny them because it's too close to another crosswalk. So obviously maybe something has changed. I'm no, just we've, saying we've, we've, once we've... that happens, I'm going to tell you all those other people are going to come back in. So I'm just going to assume that maybe circumstances have changed because we've had to deny quite a few crosswalks because... We say no because under state law in, in the um, U.S., it's like U.S. Road PC, I forget what the, the letter, that's it. That um, even if we wanted to, sometimes we've been inclined, we want to put a crosswalk in, but we're told we're precluded from doing that because it's too close to another one. We've paid attention to that factor in showing where the crosswalks are. Okay. And in some cases, it's on this side of the street versus this side of the street for exactly that reason. Okay, thank you. And I apologize for all the questions. So. Those are great questions. So, so look at me, I understand the, the, um, the frustrating part of the proposal is, is um, 
the, the timing of this. We, we, we are asked to make a decision in, um, in, in this meeting, and it, no one really saw it coming at this meeting, you know. Uh, and, and so, so I, I understand that, you know. And so, so I uh, mean, I did know that you know, that this whole stretch was still under study, you know. And that was made clear to me when we last voted you know, on, on that compromise. Me, I just didn't know when we were going to be presented with something on which we needed to vote. You know? And so I think we're going to do the best we can here um, and vote for that you know, letter of intent. You know? And we'll need to talk with people a lot more, you know, probably a lot more people in order to get you know, some sense of how to um, move forward next. You know? I mean, I, I, I think it is a beautifully comprehensive plan um, and something that you know, the community will be proud of if we uh, pull it off. Uh, and, and, and so, but uh, I, I just have a, a couple of questions about the, the mass grant. You know, and, and so um, you said that that was a surprise, right? You know, so we found out about that in October last year. Is that the deal? You know, I and, can answer yes. Okay. <laughs> you know, so 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 that is what kind of changed the trajectory of the timing of the community discussion, or were we always like kind of aiming for towards this time for making the decision? Thank you for the question. Um, I think at the time we did not know that we were going to receive the MassWorks grant, and we were using a combination of transportation funds, some capital funds, just different things sort of cobbled together to do the work that we've done so far, which is roughly another $300,000 worth of design between the temporary and then bringing the permanent to where we are right now. Um, the 307000 from the state will get us to biddable documents, um, and we found out like I said, in October, we were the award was made public in early November, and we're contracting with MassWorks now to finish the design, to bring it to the biddable documents. Um, had we not yeah. received the MassWorks funding, we would be yeah. right here where we are tonight, which is concept, you know, let's talk, let's look for money, let's look for some additional design funds, et cetera. Because we got the award, now we're sort of moving into, hey, let's finish the design, the design and let's look for some construction funding as well, okay, because so it I'm seems just, like a really positive, um, you know, positive option right now. Right, right. So that's what's making us we have to make a, a pretty significant decision in in near term, near frame. So, so, so this this um, potential of getting a lot of money being uh, is is a good problem uh, to have. I mean, rough. Do we have a sense of how much the project is going to cost? I'll let Elise answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, <laughs> um, in our initial very conceptual uh, estimates that we were putting together, we were between three and five million, because okay. um, that includes some of the utility pole relocations and some right. of those added costs um, right. that would come into play. Right, and the grant, I mean, if we get funded, I mean, it would be for that entire amount? Correct. Right, and, and so my sense is, I mean, uh, for these kind, well, well, how competitive do you think? Is some from what I know, Masterix is very competitive, right. and I think Claire is right that there is some momentum right now with just having received a grant for design that right. it shows that they believe this is a good project that they would like to see through and see it through to construction. So, right, right. Um, are, and, uh, are there elements in the grant that makes it more competitive, like more more likely that we will get the funding? Or the things that they're expecting, and or they'd like to see that would make it more appealing. I think the, I think the fact that the community has potential development opportunities coming in, and the, I'll say the spectrum of those that were presented, um, in the last application, and I think otherwise they want to be able to fund um, shovel-ready projects. So. If this project had a lot of permitting, they would want to see that the permitting was completed. Um, if there was, you know, a large right-of-way aspect, they would want to see that the land is all acquired. Um, from that perspective, this project is a little simpler because it doesn't have some of those other elements to it. So I think the most important thing is to have an accurate cost estimate and a full set of plans that we can 
you know, submit with it and say, this could go to a contractor now and put out to bid. Gotcha. So, so you said that you had done your own um, pedestrian you know, parking study. Did I hear that correctly? Because I know that um, Dan did one, you know, and yes. submitted. So, so, so did you do one in addition to that? We did no. not do a separate okay. parking study. We relied on the information from Dan. We took new counts, multimodal counts of vehicles, pedestrians, and bicyclists in, Aaron will correct me, April or May of last year um, for 12 hours over a course of several days so we can capture all the different activity that happens here. Right. I mean, so, so did you find that the study that Dan did was you, did you, think that the methodology and the conclusions well first that the methodology was good and that the conclusions were correct yeah i mean what he showed was the amount of parking that there was and where it was most used and we very much took that into account and backed it up with our own observations every time we've been out there to show where the parking was most important and tried to preserve that within the design right Okay. Dan's parking study identified four areas of interest that his study looked at in particular and looked at the um, utilization of those areas separate from the entire corridor. And we used the findings from that to, in, to determine where we would keep parking um, and where we relocated to other locations. Yeah, I mean, we asked TAC to um, look at it for various reasons. I mean, um, it's been delayed in getting back to us with COVID being one of the the issues I mean and, and so they may get back to us as, as soon as I mean their um, next meeting you know um, in, in in March you know so we may get a readout from that you know um, by mid-march um look I mean uh so like I said I understand I mean, the people are surprised by this I mean um and they're surprised that it happened you know um, that I think that he I don't know to what extent people are surprised that we are looking at that whole corridor I mean I wasn't, you know, but then I'm kind of keyed in uh, to the stuff a lot more. Um, uh, but certainly, I think people surprised me that we are me kind of relitigating, for lack of a better word, being the south um, side parking. Um, so uh, when it was presented to me that we want to discuss this at this meeting, I said, I think it would be good if we really talked to all members of the board separately, but we didn't have the time for that. You know? uh, and, and so so, um, so here we are, and I think we'll have more of those conversations, folks. I'll just toss out uh, uh, a couple of other things. I mean, I really like I mean, the crosswalks at the foot of the rocks. You know? I mean, I walked that stretch of Mass Ave I mean, um, a, lot, a fair amount, you know, and I think I mean, uh, that crosswalk, I mean, uh, the alignment of it will be much better than what we currently have, and it'll fit in very nicely with the current thinking for the Foot of the Rocks uh, development. Uh, I like the plaza um, area, uh, uh, and and I think now the term art is making place instead of just placemaking. <laughs> and then when, when they told me that there was the, the possibility of putting the bus stop in front of that so that the Odyssey kids no longer have to cross the street, but a bus stop, I mean, that was like a winning um, proposition for me. Uh, um, let's see. Um, so, um, yeah, the bus stop, the bump. Yeah, bump, bump outs. The bump outs are the only thing that I, I sometimes cringe about because I think of their impact I mean, on, on bike lanes and I also think of the impact if you do try to do a bus lane. In, but but that's just it and I, I understand the, the benefits of them. Uh, so uh, I, I just like to say, I, mean, to, I know that Dan kind of got the ball rolling on this and he's no longer here. I just really want to thank him for getting the ball rolling on this and for the um, work that you all um, have done on this. Like I said, I, I, think, I, 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 think, it's, I think it's really beautiful. Uh, and, and like I said, I think if we can get most of it done and it is something that will make the town proud. I didn't see the, um, the protected bike lane using part of the, the sidewalk on the north, north side coming in, and maybe because I just wasn't paying close attention at the meetings, but I think that's great because I walk that area a lot once again, and that part of the sidewalk really isn't used. In fact, it's kind of bad territory. You know, you don't really even want to walk there. I mean, so I think if you're kind of uh, removing it and putting it, putting a substitute uh, a protected bike lane in there, it's really beautiful. Uh, and so, so I look at the thing and I say, let's see how much we can get done. I mean, and let's talk with people and listen with people. Uh, and and uh, we'll go forward as much as we can. So, uh, 
are there any other if someone in the room can talk you know just say something mr chair yeah great yeah, yes yeah. i said something. Uh, sir. Sir. <laughs> yeah. I, b I believe mr hurd was uh, trying yeah. to get your attention yeah, yeah. please mr hurd yeah i'm so i didn't, wasn't even aware of the timing when i spoke before so i would just reiterate that it's a little frustrating to get this and say, oh, but you got to give us a letter of approval because we have to meet this timeline. But that being said, I mean, I think I've said my piece here. A letter of approval, it, I will support a letter that we want somebody else to pay for this project. And we'll leave it at that. And that's about as much approval as I'll give it, but I'll leave it there. Um, but again, I mean, you can go forward with it. Public comment. I know you're collecting public comment, but I mean, with Mr. DeCourcy out, you have four members of the board, which means you need three members of the board to vote on any changes to this street. So, I mean, I would kick it back to the designers now to, I think, it, your feet are now at the fire to go and redesign this based on what you heard from two members of the board, because without, you just don't have the majority. You can go through this whole process, and if the board doesn't support it, then the board doesn't support it, and we go back to the drawing board. So I would just leave that comment to you, is I think you are now under the gun to make, come up with a plan that this board not only will get the funding that we want, but this board will approve the changes to the traffic rules and order. So. Okay. All right. No, so um, any other comments, questions? All right, so um, on a motion to uh, send a letter of intent you know, um, by Mr. Helmuth and a second for that by uh, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hurt? Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. It's a 4 0 vote with Mr. DeCourcy recusing himself. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone, thank for the presentation. You know, I mean, I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Well, Mr. Well, Corsi comes in, I can pull up the next item on the agenda. <laughs> Welcome back, Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and we're now on to item number. 12, presentation and approval on Save the Hill White Brook. And, and I am going to um, ask Vice Chair, Madam Vice Chair, um, Ms. Mahan, me to introduce um, this topic to the guests. I think, all right, first, um, Mr. Helmut. Thank you, oh, Ms. Mr. 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 Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I need to recuse myself from this uh, due to the state uh, the conflict of interest law. Um, in my employment by the legislature, and my understanding is that this will ask the select board to petition the legislature. Okay, great, thank you. Ms. Mahan? I'm just going to wait till Mr. Helmuth sure. exits the room for clarity's sake. Welcome back, Mr. Thank, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. You should hear what they said about no, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm going to be very brief. I know that. Um, the one of the co-chairs of uh, Save the L. White Brook uh, submitted an email to all of us here on the board in terms of, um, in particular, why one of our colleagues had to recuse himself, um, seeking our possible support on some legislation, as well as we received correspondence um, regarding the uh, CSO process with the city's of Cambridge, Somerville, and MWRA in public process. But I'll, what I'd like to do right now, if she's been promoted, is ask um, <clears throat> Kristen Anderson, um, one of the original proponents who requested this agenda item, to speak and go from there. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Um, Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good evening. Um, uh, dear members of the select board, <clears throat> town council, town manager, thank you so much for um, giving Save the Life Brook the opportunity to be here this evening. David White, um, David Stoff, Gwen Spieth um, are all here from Save the Life Brook with me this evening. 
Save the Ilwife Brook is a grassroots environmental group with supporters in the communities along the Ilwife Brook and the Little River, including Arlington, Belmont, Cambridge, Somerville, and Medford. We formed our organization to raise awareness about the unsafe condition of the brook and to advocate for an end to untreated sewage discharges. We envision an Ilwife Brook that is safe to live near an environmentally healthy community resource. This evening, we ask for your support of new state legislation concerning combined sewer overflows. The legislation has been introduced by representatives Rogers and Madaro and representative Garbley is a co-sponsor. There is a new Elwife Brook long-term sewage control plan being developed at this time by Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, Cambridge and Somerville, the three entities that dump untreated human and industrial waste mixed with stormwater into Elwife Brook during rainstorms. This new long-term sewage control plan is meant to mitigate the problem of untreated sewage pollution in the brook. We believe that where there is political will, money plus time can solve, can solve problems. But along the Elwife Brook, political will is naturally splintered because the brook itself max, marks the boundary between four separate municipalities with four different local governments, Arlington, Belmont, Cambridge, and Somerville. And the city of Medford is just yards away from where the Elwife meets the Mystic River. Further, MWRA bears responsibility for its CSO that dumps untreated human and industrial waste into Alewife Brook. Historically, polluters have clutched their purse strings, closed their eyes, held their noses, and sent their pollution downstream where it becomes someone else's nightmare. That nightmare manifests itself as a serious health hazard during flood events in East Arlington's most diverse environmental justice population block. This is why the alewife needs help from the state through legislation. The Commonwealth can greatly improve water quality by passing legislation to bring all untreated combined sewer overflows in the MWRA's sewer system area to a 25 year level of control meaning untreated sewage pollution would be discharged on average only once every 25 years. This is one standard that is currently applied to other CSOs in the Boston area, including along on the beaches along the bay. Polluters would be required to eliminate more frequent discharges or ensure that, they do, that those that do occur are treated. This would be a big step towards addressing the problem while the cities continue to separate their antique combined sewer lines. Um, and I think I sent a, a map along that I was hoping you could share. Um, <clears throat> terrific. Okay, so this is um, a map um, from MWRA. Um, and you can see the green dots are um, active and untreated CSO outfalls where hazardous sewage pollution is discharged during heavy storm events. There are six active CSO outfalls in the Elwife Brook. And in 2021, 51 million gallons of untreated sewage pollution was discharged in the Elwife Brook. The orange dots are CSOs that have a 25 year level of control. Note that there are four outfalls in the bay that have 25 year level of control. This is what we seek from the state for all remaining untreated CSOs in the MWRA system. This legislation would bring the same level of CSO control to the alewife as is afforded along the bay, which makes recreational swimming possible on Boston beaches, as represented um, by orange dots on the map. This is something MWRA can do, and this legislation gives them 10 years to accomplish this for the alewife. This legislation exists because of the initiative of Jean Benson. Jean Benson is on the Save the Alewife Brook Steering Committee, but cannot be here this evening because of a schedule conflict he is an active member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board and they are meeting at this time. 
Mr. Benson is a lawyer who worked at MWRA, and he has served on the board of the Mystic River Watershed Association. He has written this legislation on behalf of Save the Alewife Brook with input and support from the Mystic River Watershed Association. Um, and again, if it passes, this law would eliminate untreated CSO discharges, um, except in larger storm events, meaning the 25 year storms are larger. It would be a huge improvement for Alewife Brook and the legislation allows the CSO permittees a decade to either reduce or eliminate CSO discharges or add treatment facilities. We ask for your support for this legislation tonight. Please vote in favor of it for a safer Alewife Brook. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I'll turn to my colleagues. Mr. Hart. I'd like to move approval of issuing the letter of support. And thank you for all your efforts. And the, uh, you know, I know we talk about this from time to time, probably not enough, but as much as I think we, we do it, every time we do it, baffle, I don't know why I get shocked over and over again. <laughs> the thought of raw sewage being dumped into the L.Y. Brook and someone thinking that's okay. But I'm glad that the town and the surrounding towns and the legislature is taking steps to prevent that. And uh, again, thank you for all your work on this subject. Again, Mrs. Mahan is quite an advocate for this cause on this board, particularly. Oh, <coughs> excuse me, second Mr. Hurd's motion. And what I would do is ask if um, Ms. Anderson and or uh, Mr. Benson could work with through the chair um, in, uh, during this week with some verbiage. Uh, I'm blanking on it if it's HR 1610. I can't remember what the actual citation of the legislation is, but um, just to make sure that we send a, a concise but um, hit all the points letter to the legislative delegation. So if you could just um, uh, either figure out how you're going to work with the chair, select board office, and attorney Heim and hopefully get that out um, within seven days or whenever you think is appropriate. If you think we have more time, that's fine too. Um, and then um, I do have one other question on uh, the agenda material, but Mr. Chair, should I wait and just deal with this first? Um, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I yeah, guess, I guess it's it's on what it is. is. You know, is it related? It is, and I can make it real brief. Um, yeah, please. The, the, uh, Agenda material attached to tonight's agenda has a, a copy of a correspondence dated February 24th, 2023 to MassDEP um, regarding uh, the ongoing discussions uh, regard that the cities of Cambridge, Somerville, and MW, Mystic, MWR, Mass Water Resources Association are having. I do know that uh, various employees of the town, including Attorney Heim, have been attending those meetings, um, listening and, and taking the information, um, and sometimes also speaking at that. So my really brief question would be, I also anticipate, and I don't know um, which department heads it would apply to besides uh, Attorney Heim, but I'm thinking uh, our Director of Health and Human Services, Ms. Bongiorno, and whomever else, that when the town's uh, submission to Mass DEP is at that point where it's pretty much done in draft form, um, I would anticipate that the full board would see that to see if there's anything they want to uh, amend, delete, uh, or add to it. So just seeing their submission to DEP triggered in me that I'd like to, when it's appropriate, um, see what it is, the town of Arlington. I know we have Save the Owl White Brook. I know Charles River Watershed Association is submitting theirs. I know uh, Mystic River Watershed Association is submitting theirs. But I also know the towns of Belmont, the town of Belmont is submitting from the town. I'd like to see what's coming from Arlington um, that 
in accordance with past practice, the select board um, also signs on to. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Sorry. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm, I'm also happy to support this. I want to thank Ms. Anderson for all her work and, and save the yellow life for the other members as well. And, and Mrs. Mahan, your work in, in getting this before the board and, 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 and working with them. And it, it's House 3316, um, and I know Representative Garbel, I think, is also a co-sponsor of it. So, um, yeah, that's all my comments. Thank you for the presentation and for the extensive notes that you were uh, provided to us as part of our agenda package. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, Ms. Anderson, you know, so did you seek other co-sponsors? Um, we're working on it. We're, we, we will be. We will okay. be um, working on this heavily. Okay, that's fine, thank you. How much do you think it will cost um, to take care of this problem? Um, like how many I don't know. I don't know. I mean, do you mean for, to solve the problem. Well, there are a lot of problems. The, the one that we um, want to solve. And, and we. By this legislation. Oh, for this legislation, I don't know what the what this would cost the state. Okay. I'm not so, sure what it would cost the state. So this hasn't been assigned to a committee yet, right? No. So so then, I mean, normally, I me, mean, what you want to do is send a letter, I mean, to the committee that gets it, right? Mm-hmm. That's what, that would be to the extent a letter is effective. That would be probably the point at which is most effective. So, so we'll probably want to wait until it's been assigned to a committee, you know, and then find the chair of that committee, you know, or, or the members of that committee, and then send letters to them. Because the deal is that you want to get it reported, a favor report out of that committee, right, to the next step, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then we do have time. And, uh, all right. Okay. All right. So, so yeah, because I think right now, I mean, we're going to send it to the folks who are already supporting it, I mean, as in Representative Rogers and, um, and Gobberly, we were not really gaining anything. We want to reach the members of the committee to which the legislation on um, the bill is assigned, right? Sure. Okay. Uh, All right. Mr. I mean, Chairman, could I just add that um, uh, it actually does help the legislators who are supporting this um, for them to have it initially, not to convince them for the support, but when they are moving forward um, towards the stakeholders that are on the committee that will be hearing this. Um, the biggest thing is when you're in the state house, is, it is if you're a show and go or fluff and puff or something like that, that legislation gets filed all the time. But when they have a, a letter of support from the municipality with the proponents that are proposing the legislation who are already on board, that's sort of a, a signal, not sort of, it is a signal that this wasn't filed for the sake of filing. This is something that is a serious request. Um, so I, I would want to do the letter now um, just to follow that process because it kind of is a tool that they use to say, this is something we really do want and the municipality um, really does want. And in terms of cost, I can tell you having started on this uh, back in 1995, um, when I was advocating for the total elimination within 50 years, back in 1995 of all CSOs, that at that point, the cities of Cambridge, Medford and MWRA knew what that would cost because Fred Lasky from MWRA threw that number back at me to say how cost prohibitive it is and it just can't be done. And I also know from attending currently the meetings um, that have been held by Cambridge Somerville MWRA, um, Owen O'Riordan from uh, the city of Cambridge, the consultant group from the city of Somerville and oh my Lord, I'm, I'm blanking on, uh, it's not Fred Lasky, the gentleman from MWRA. Uh, who's overseeing this, they already know what the number is if they were told, whether through legislation or otherwise, that they had to embark on something like this. So it's kind of a nebulous, quiet thing. A number is known, and the right, stakeholders right. know about it. So right. thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. I hear you. And, and I, mean, I guess what I'm thinking about is, is the fact that when I came to this board, you know, I think in my first year, maybe my second year, you know, because the group that I was working with the state trying to pass enabling legislation for a real estate transfer fee, I mean, you know, 
the goal then was to get me and as many select boards to me to to show that they uh, support this. And I came to um, you all and asked for that, and you gave it to me. And and, and, and as I've said, I mean, I kind of regret doing that it, uh, because I, I felt well. It, it, it's not at all clear to me, me that it made a difference. I mean, um, and secondly, I mean, I feel that if a letter were going to be effective, I mean, it, it'd probably be better coming from um, each member. I mean, and also, I was thinking kind of more generally, I don't want to put the board in a situation where members be or feeling that they need to sign on to it I mean, when it's not necessarily something that he, they wholeheartedly support I me. Mean, and so he, the board could be say, well, we support me. The, the board could say, well, it's okay to, um, I guess maybe put it on board letterhead or, but I, I don't know, I'm getting a little, a little, um, I'm losing yeah. the yeah, thought no, but we, here. We, I, I really want it. We have a motion uh, and it's been seconded. Um, and I guess I would say any, uh, individual select board member that doesn't support this and doesn't want to sign on doesn't have to. So thank you. Okay, that's fine. So so so, so as long as long as that's the, the understanding. And so so and, and my inclination is to sign, but I just don't want to put members in a situation where they feel that that they have to. So so as long as that's understanding, it's great. And so okay. So um, with that, um, any other comments, questions? All right, so on a motion to send a letter by uh, Mr. Hearn and a second by Ms. Mahan. Mr. Hearn. Mr. Hearn. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. yes. It's a 4 0 vote with Mr. Holland recusing himself. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Sorry. Excuse me. Sure. So we'll go through this one next item quickly, and then if people want to take a break before we do the resolutions, uh, we can. So, so um, thanks for joining us, Mr. Helmuth. So quickly on MBT assessments, you know, so I know that there is continuing discussion or concern about these, you know, and, and I, have, I have asked around about when the legislature is going to be take up in the MBT assessments, and I'm not hearing anything. In fact, I mean, if anything, you know, people I mean, aren't even aware I mean, of it as an issue. I mean, and so I was under the strong impression that the, that the legislature was going to have to look at assessments again I mean, when the South Coast Rail, the extension of the commuter rail, uh, came online. I mean, and, and, the anticipation is that that would happen in this legislative session. I mean, so, um, as I said, I got this from the executive director I mean, of the MET advisory board. I mean, and so, uh, what I'm inclined to do now I mean, is ask uh, Attorney Heim, I mean, if he could look into um, seeing when, I mean, these, when assessments have to be reopened, is it really linked to South Coast Rail? I mean, so, I think. A uh, search through the legislation will give us something conclusive. I mean, and then once I know, I mean, whether or not that really has to happen, then I feel more confident, you know, pursuing this by asking um, whomever I think is the best person to ask um, in the legislature. Legislature. Also, uh, depending on what comes out of this, especially if it's a uh, yes that we need to, I mean, I would like to um, ask Ms. Mahan, you know, um, uh, to work with me to meet with the the chair of uh, the advisory board, I mean, uh, that's Mayor Koch, I mean, from Quincy, I mean, and and, um, and Representative Garbley, I mean, to discuss, I mean, how to go about um, finding out the best way to calculate the assessments, I mean, so that, I mean, Arlington feels as if, I mean, it's being treated um, equitably or fairly. So um, that's my comment on this. Um, any questions, comments, concerns? Uh, I'd be happy to, happy to work with you on that. Um, and I'll commit whatever amount of time needed to, to have that conversation and go from there. I sort of have June 30th as a deadline uh, in terms of under state law when assessments 
under state law, the, the way I read it is they're supposed to be reassessed every year uh, around that time. So that's sort of the end clock time working backwards. And, and if I could, um, Mr. Chairman, if I could just ask if the town manager um, uh, could just share briefly with the board, I, I along with others, have had conversations um, with the town manager regarding the M MWRA, MWRA, MBTA uh, assessments and um, had a conversation with the town manager about coming up with a draft uh, letter for the board to consider to um, present at the appropriate time by June uh, regarding the new communities, municipalities that are coming online so we're requesting uh, reevaluation, reassessment of our MBTA assessment, which is ridiculous, and as well as the elimination of two bus routes and depends on who you talk to, 20 to 30 percent MBTA reduction. Um, and I know that the town manager, if you could just share what you shared with me as well as, I think you said uh, the town, yourself, or somebody else has already been having these conversations and or may have already spoken. I think it might have been you through MMA or something else. But if you could give the same brief update to my colleagues that you gave to me on that. Thank you. Uh, That's okay, Mr. Chair. Yes, 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 sure. yes so I... Uh, I spoke with uh, the director of the MBTA Advisory Board about um, this process. I think I've also been trying to do this in conjunction with Chair Diggins because he is the town representative on that board. Um, and so I think his efforts and my efforts have gone hand in hand in uh, trying to determine the timeline for this what the process is going to be, whether in fact uh, there needs to be a reassessment, uh, and reconfiguration of those assessments, uh, and one, whether those assessments are going to be done under the law as was written years ago that uh, prejudices, frankly, Arlington, um, or whether uh, uh, because these new communities are going to come in, they're going to have to reassess that. So uh, I think Chair Diggins and I have been trying to get that figured out. We, at one point, we're going to have a meeting with the chair of the advisory board. He had to cancel. Um, so um, I think we're still working on trying to figure out the exact legal process. That's what he asked Attorney Heim to do. Um, and then we will continue to go forward to figure out where we have the opportunity to have some input and what that input should be, depending on what the legal constraints are or the legal situation is. And I, I hope I have answered the question the same way that I answered it to you before. Yes, somebody's gonna write that freaking letter. I don't care who. I'll write it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That Make that request. That's all I want. Okay. okay. So, so I will turn it to you all to see if you want to break before we go into resolutions. What is, I didn't hear, I heard turn to you. Does anyone want to break? I, I, I had a long break. Yeah, <laughs> same, and I have more to come. We're all, all right. set. We're all set? Thank, okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, no problem. So, so um, we will move on now into resolutions. We, so what do you know? The first resolution is on M M a resolution to improve MBTA service. And I think that's um, from Mr. Slickman. Hello, Mr. Slickman. How are, are you all doing? Doing fine. How are you? Good. I've got a cat snoring next to me. If Hello. you hear snoring, it's the cat. Only that we're in the chambers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh, we got a cat person. Hello, me okay. <laughs> we have lots of articles. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the first item before I, I, the, I have a pair of uh, articles I submitted. The first one really addresses the MBTA at this point because there has been a, a tremendous loss of service 
uh, to the town of Arlington over the years, and it just keeps on getting worse and worse and worse. And we're now finding in our, ourselves in a position where we're being asked to do some zoning changes because we have MBTA service and we have a community that desires to be walkable and uh, sustainable and availing itself of uh, MBTA services while the service itself is being cut. Uh, and the irony of this is beyond all the other cuts we had is that at the moment the MBTA opened the new Green Line extension out to Tufts Medford, uh, two days later they cut the service on the 80 bus that is the only bus from Arlington that connects to the Green Line extension. So um, one of the reasons why the Green Line extension was, was put through, through all sorts of legal challenges to, to the state and the Big Dig, was that it's a mitigation against the traffic being generated by the Big Dig and people using cars instead of transit and for the extension to be terminated early rather than going all the way out to uh, Mystic Valley Parkway uh, and to have no way to get to the Green Line extension for people in Arlington, all that's going to do is encourage people to use cars through that area that has been requesting mitigation. So I put together a brief resolution, a draft that's in your packet, of what we might present to town meeting, because I think it's time for the town, town meeting and uh, my, my friends on the select board to make a statement. I will also state that, I, that we have real concerns on the school side, because we have relied on the MBTA for years and years and years for student transit for uh, children in grades seven through 12, and the deterioration of services wrecked havoc on kids getting to school on time to the point where we've had to uh, look into uh, yellow school buses where we didn't run them to get kids up to the Odyssey. All right, um, so um, Mr. Um, Helmick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I apologize for the uh, odd being uh, my discontinuity here. I also need to recuse myself for this item, so I'm not going to make any substantive comments. And the following item, because it's special legislation, and then um, the state flag and seal item as well. So I'm uh, go off on another break. Okay, thank you. And it's for the same reasons as before. So, anyone? Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Schlickman, for the, the draft resolution. Um, I have separate comments on your other warrant article, but I, I, you, we have all seen the reductions and, and have been disappointed by the reductions that are being proposed or that have put, been put in place. So, um, I, I would it, we'll talk about this, but I would support some sort of resolution. My only concern in here as, as drafted, and I realize that you've said that you've drafted a shell of a resolution for us to consider and, and, and maybe add to, is just the inclusion of the comparison to Quincy. And I know that's a, a separate issue on the assessments, but we're disappointed in the service and what's happened. I'm not sure if that's the place to, to, to compare ourselves to Quincy, but everything else I... I agree with you and I share your concerns and, and share the concerns of the uh, school department and school committee on reductions in service to the 77 bus in the morning in particular. So uh, thank you for putting this before us. Second. Mr. Um, Hurt? No, happy to support it. Oh, you know. Um, it, I, I understand the desire here. You know, it, it, I actually had put in the materials, me, and uh, uh, actually for the, the previous um, item, me, and under the stress me, the uh, equity analysis. And in that, it kind of explains to me the rationale that he had for uh, the, doing the bus network um, redesign, which is where me, the projected um, changes me, and, um, in. Um, service to uh, well, 
system wide, bus wide, in, um, are coming from. In, uh, uh, in, um, it's, it, I get into a, a bit of a state you know, with these resolutions uh, because I mean, there's a part of me, a big part of me, that appreciates me, the uh, engagement in, of residents on issues I mean, and their desire to try to affect change. I mean, um, uh, this isn't going to do it. You know, uh, be, be what will do it I mean, is be for the T to appreciate I me mean, that there is the demand you know, for the service I mean, from certain points you know, and the money you know, to provide that service. I mean, um, now the T lacks, lacks the money and more so it lacks the, the drivers, the, the, the employees. I mean, um, the overall state of the T has been caused by a serious lack of investment I mean, for, for, for decades, I mean, essentially stuck with since Ford funding um, started. I mean, so, so we can ask for it, you know. It's, I, I think we're, we're better I mean, working on you know, zoning changes that will allow for you know, more housing, in, especially in that Broadway area, you know, uh, so that if we could show I mean, that in a decade or so, you know, there is going to be you know, a lot more people there who would be inclined to use transportation, it'd be one more argument you know, to extend uh, the green line you know, to, to, um, to the Mystic Valley Hub. Um, um, Parkway, you know, so, so it, it, I don't want to vote against it because I don't want to discourage people. I don't want to vote for it because I don't want to encourage people to do something I mean, that really isn't the best uh, use of their time. And so, so I'm going to decide on between, uh, I'll probably abstain, you know, just because I don't want to be bad. I don't want to be a bad person, but, but I don't want to um, mislead you. So, so, um, any other comments, questions? Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and of course, each one of us is free to vote however we see fit. But I, I see this more as a statement of concern uh, uh, about where things are going. I completely understand the personnel issues that the MBTA has right now in, in, in terms of finding employees. But to Mr. Schlickman's point, I mean, six day, the, the, the 80 bus of all buses mm. to be cut, there's no data on that because the, the station hasn't been open. So I, I, I see this as a, a, you know, a letter of concern and, and whether or not anything happens to it, it, it shows that, that this board is concerned about service to our community. I understand, but, but it's, it's a resolution. No, I understand, to, I, I, absolutely. And, and that's why I said it's a, it's a statement. Okay, I thought you said letter, so that's No, 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 oh, okay, if I said letter, it's a resolution, but it, it, it's a statement of concern. All right, I understand. So, uh, so any other comments and questions? Okay, so um, I did not write this one down, but I think I remember it. It was a motion to adopt a resolution by Mr. Mr. Chair. Course. Yes, Mr. Uh, I think you have to open it up for open. public comments. That's true. That's true. That I had thought about that and just forgot. So, um, any comments, you know, or any other counterpoints on on the resolution? Do you see any in um, online? That's all right. And I should note that I was often had. That had to be reminded to me. So. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I, look, I appreciate it. It's all, it's all, it's all of us work together in here, you know. And so I, I remembered it, and then I forgot, and I'll probably do it again. Okay, so, um, Ms. Meyer, did you say there were any hands? There's, let me just double check. No hands raised at this time. Thank you. All right, and no one in the room. Okay. All right. So. So, on a uh, motion to adopt the resolution, I think it's by Mr. Corsi and a second by Ms. Mahan. Correct. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And you know, so, um, Mr. Hine. Mr. Hurt? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Davis? Abstain. Abstain. The vote is 3 0 uh, 1 with Mr. Hellman, uh recusing himself. Great. Okay. So, our next 
is a special legislation, it's an article on special legislation repeal MBTA prohibition. Uh, Mr. Sutton again. Thank you very much. I've spent a lot of time reading Arlington Advocates from the 1970s because uh, I, like anybody else who's been active in discussions about Arlington, particularly when it comes to transit, uh, often get the feedback of, well, Arlington didn't want the red line. Uh, Arlington shot down the red line. And uh, in 1976, I was a very young New York voter. Um, and for all the folks who were not residents of Arlington in 1976, and were not voters in Arlington in 1976, uh, the decision to fight the red line and have it terminated at Alewife is without a doubt the second most consequential decision in the history of the town of Arlington. Now, I think that people right now in the 21st century have a right to express their opinions and determine uh, what kind of a community we want to have. Now, we can't have any discussion about improving transit through Arlington Center as long as this law is on the books. So what repealing this law does, it doesn't change anything except it would clear the books of a ban that was inherently designed to prevent the red line from coming into town. Uh, I, I think it's time for us to express, uh, to just reset the discussion. Whether anything is going to happen this year, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years out, I think it's important that we come back at this point in time and say, that, that law wasn't a particularly good idea. It killed something, that, and, and it stays on the books at this point. And to repeal that, just sets a neutral playing ground for any discussion we want to go forward on. Uh, I gave you an extensive history and quotes behind why this happened and extensive discussion of it, some poorly worded ba uh, ballot questions to replace in the ballot that really didn't give the opportunity for a, a, a good outcome uh, of, of uh, the, the popular opinion. So. Let's just clear the decks, go back to ground zero, repeal this law, and just leave ourselves in a place where we can discuss about transit options without having state law uh, being a barrier. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Um, questions, comments? Mr. Hurd. Mr. Slickman, are you going to leave us all wondering what the most consequential decision <laughs> in Allegan history was? Oh, well, that, that's pretty easy. It was the decision to uh, uh, be set aside from the, uh, the, from the then town of Con uh, Cambridge and to form a town on our own. That was the most consequential. Okay. just wanted to confirm for our viewers. Um, <laughs> yeah. As a former Arlington Catholic student, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I, I get what the uh, original intent of this law is, but I'm happy to have a motion to approve. Second. Any other yeah. questions, comments? Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, I, I, and I, I remember when this happened because I looked at it <laughs> at the time. And I also um, took the opportunity to look at the advocate and we, we own, owe a continuing debt to, to Mr. Duffy for, for all the work that he did to digitize the advocate, but on this one, I agreed on, on the, the prior resolution. I don't necessarily agree to seek the repeal of this act, and, and I'll tell you why. This, this act actually, um, it was a big deal when it passed because Governor DeCarcus actually came to Arlington to sign the bill at Arlington Catholic, and Tip O'Neill came out it, 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 to Arlington Catholic as well, and, and this wasn't the bill that killed the red line coming to Arlington, what, what it prevented, and, and I'm going to quote Governor Dukakis from, a, um, from the advocate in October of 1976. 
and, and he said, now any station will be built a distance from the high school, meaning Arlington Catholic. It will be a community station to serve the people of Arlington, not a regional one drawing traffic from miles around. There won't be any parking garage unless the townspeople want it, Governor Dukakis said last week at Arlington Catholic. Tip O'Neill also commented that, that the real opposition, which wasn't successful, was the following year where Representative Kizak had a file legislation to prevent the T from coming into Arlington and from terminating in Arlington because um, the original plan was that it would go all the way out to Route 128. Had that passed, I would agree with you, Mr. Schlickman, that it would make sense to repeal it. But this, this 75 yards, and there was different reasons. The St. Agnes Church and Arlington Catholic certainly had different reasons for not having this station within 75 yards. But when the governor, who was a proponent of the red line and commuted to work from, from Brookline, came out to sign it, he was just saying it's not going to be there because we won't put a parking garage there. So I, I also am concerned about asking the legislature to repeal something now. We have a number of home rule petitions every year, every other year, that we ask our delegation to help shepherd through the legislature. Where I, I don't agree that this was the thing that prevented the red line, I, I really don't want to ask them to do that. So I, I unfortunately, will, will oppose this. And, and not for your concern, I think there were other consequential decisions. And at, at the end of the day, it, it, towards the end of 1977, our town manager at the time, Don Marquis, came back from Washington and said the red line's not going to go to Arlington because there's not enough money to fund it. That's, that's really where every, everything ended. And, and um, there was only enough money to go to Alewife. Um, and, and there were other concerns that, that you know, just the cost of going underground all the way through Arlington, if that was going to happen, were prohibitive. So I, I enjoyed the history lesson, but I, I just I don't feel like this is the act that, that, that prevented the red line. And I, just feel it's, it's, it's not something I want to ask Senator Friedman or Representative Rogers or Representative Garbally to, 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 to attempt to appeal. <laughs> well, that was interesting. You know, uh, so me, you're, um, hey, I really appreciated the history, um, Mr. Slickman, you know, but, um, but Mr. DeCourcy, you certainly gave me a lot to think about uh, there. And, uh, uh, so, so Mr. Um, Mr. Slickman, what is the effect of the legislation now, I mean, regardless of its original intent? Uh, the effect of the legislation essentially is that uh, nothing can be done within 75 uh, yards of uh, Arlington Catholic High School. And that property, that would extend that 75 yard barrier onto Mass Ave at Medford Street. And because of the property lines would extend it certainly uh, well into the present parking lot and beyond. Uh, we, we can draw up a map off the uh, GIS. But as far as the effect is concerned, uh, nobody's proposing to build anything there at this point. But this is an effort to, more than anything else, than to clear the decks. Uh, it is really, in this point, somewhat symbolic to not have a law that prevents any kind of transit uh, facility being built within Arlington Center, uh, within, the, within that constraint. So it's sort of. It, it's, I'm, I'm really viewing this as clearing the decks to resetting the table to being at a point where there's no law in favor or against, no resolution in favor or against. We're sort of just saying, you know, let's clear that history. The town is different today. Clear, clear the decks, set, reset the framework so we can have further discussions. All right, gotcha. Um, Okay, I may have a little bit more to say, but I'm just going to check first to see, I mean, um, uh, since this is a, a hearing, to see if there are any, um, one who wants to speak to this. Seeing no hands raised. Excuse me? Excuse me? No hands raised at this time. No hands raised, yeah, right. 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 Uh, well, I'll give other people a chance to say more. All right. 
you know. Yeah. Look, I mean, yeah. I, I was I was all for this until I heard Mrs. Corsi's you know comments. You know, he, me, my inclination is to um, talk with in our delegates to see you know um, how they feel about this, and and so um, what. I mean, at this point, he, because I think it could help with future, you know, transit um, possibilities in that area. I mean, um, he, uh, maybe it might not be the thing that does it, I mean, but maybe it could spark I me mean, the thoughts of of other things that other legislation that may need to be changed or 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 proposed. Um, in order to allow for me that kind of development in that area, I'm inclined to uh, support it. But I don't. I want to warn you me, that I'm going to have conversations uh, with people, and that we will have a chance to um, revisit uh, this. Me, and and so uh, um, I'll probably stay where I am. You know, I'm asking those conversations, but I just want to warn you that may not be the case. Me, so. Um, Mr. Mr. Hurt, is that a hand up? Yeah, I mean, I would say that I definitely appreciate Mr. Corsi's comments and that we don't want to bog down our legislatures with legislation that has really no practical effect. Um, but I guess I would just say I don't, uh, this has been filed by Mr. Schlickman and as we review it, I still am not 100% sure I get the original purpose or what it's trying to affect, so I will still vote yes. Any other comments? Okay. okay. All right, so on a motion to uh, vote positive action on the resolution by Mr. Hurd and second by Ms. Mahan. Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hurd. Yes. This, uh, Mr. Corsi. Yes. No. Uh, Mrs. Vaughn? Yes. Mr. Dickens? Yes. yes. All right. It's a 3 1 vote with Mr. Helmuth recusing himself. Thank you. So, on to the. So, thank you, Mr. Slickman. Have a oh, good night. Thank you, my friends. Uh, have a wonderful night. So, um, we next have um, article. Well, so, my understanding is this article has. Um, and uh, Paul, it's wrong. Thank you. And so, do we still need yes, yes, yes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I? When, when folks sign a, a resident petition, we still need to dispose of it. So, uh, even if it's been withdrawn, uh, the board should take a very quick vote. Motion for voted no action. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Second. So, um, I guess we'll wait. Well, actually, I should just do something that's coming. So, um, no need for discussion. Mr. Hyde. Mr. On motion to, I'm sorry. No, my bad. No, 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 Yes. Quick look. None. There's okay. no hands raised. No. Roll it. <laughs> Thank, right, you. Right. Mr. Hurt, Thank you. Mr. Hurts. So, Mr. Corsi. Corsi. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. For no action, correct? Yes. yes I'm sorry. Mr. Diggins. Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. I didn't write it down. Four zero vote. Four zero vote with Mr. Helmuth recusing himself. So um, next, next the article resolution change state flag and seal. Yes, he's. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we've been going for quite a bit of time without a break. Uh, you have a lot of stamina. Uh, um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Our here before the select board. Um, our resolution 
Select board in the town of Arlington to support the work of the special commission relative to the seal and motto of the Commonwealth. Uh, the special commission was established by unanimous support from the Massachusetts. Let me just say quickly. Wait, is, in, is, is, are other people having see, problems here? Uh, yes. No. Approval. Of I think he's frozen. Okay, so other people are hearing problems here. Okay, so so um, Mr. Solomon, I'm going to ask that you turn off your video. Can you turn off your video because we're, we're not able to hear you. Thank you. All right. The the resolution also yes. yes yes I'm afraid your audio is just not you know, not working so we're really not able to hear you I mean it'd be one case it'd be one thing if we couldn't see you you know but but we can't hear you you know. Mark Pacheco and as uh, representative uh, and is, is there someone your, else from your group that could maybe help um, with the presentation? Chairs of the joint. Happy to read that. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yes. Mr. Solomon has been kind enough to uh, put his statement in the chat would you like me to read it sure, sure. i apologize mr Solomon. we can't we can't hear you um and the feed keeps cutting out so the words i'm about to recite are mr solomon's words thank you for the opportunity to present our case here before the select board a resolution our resolution asks the select board in the town of arlington to support the work of the special commission relative to the seal and motto of the commonwealth the Special Commission was established by unanimous support from the Massachusetts State Senate and received approval of former Governor Charlie Baker to replace the current seal and motto of the Massachusetts State flag with a new seal and motto. The resolution also asked the town clerk to forward a copy of this resolution to Senator Mark Pacheco and Representative Antonio Cabral, co-chairs of the Joint, Commission, Joint Committee on State Administration and to Senator Cindy Freeman, Representative Dave Rogers, and Representative Sean Garbley with the request that they continue their strong support for the work of the aforementioned Special Commission and advocacy for a new flag and seal of the Commonwealth. I'll begin tonight with a brief introduction, explaining the resolution, and then a brief background of the issue. I'm sorry, it looks like it cuts out at that point in time. Mr. Chair? <laughs> yes, yes, Mr. Herb. Sure. Um, I don't know if we could do this during time, but I anticipate favorable action here. Um, can we just rely on the materials provided and maybe give comments and see if we have a motion? Is that okay? <laughs> I, I, I certainly think under the circumstance, Mr. Chair, may? Yes, Mr. Yes, I would provide the board the opportunity to discuss it, give the public opportunity to comment. Um, I, I can actually answer a few questions. Mr. Uh, Solomon provided some terrific reference material that were helpful in uh, illuminating me on the current posture of the special commission. So I, I think that we can proceed and hopefully Mr. Solomon's uh, connection will improve. Well, I think if we go through the board and hear opinions, it may not be <laughs> necessary to further convince. Um, I'll move po positive action on this. I support the effort too. Second. So any questions, comments? No, you know. So um, any questions, comments from um, online or in the chambers? There's no hands raised at this time, Mr. Chair. Um, we can answer this. Um, I, I think I've read it. You know. So it seems like there's already more being done on this. And, and and the deadline is, is sometime this year. So 
we're moving towards the, where this resolution is taking us? Mr. Hyde? So the, the, there was a commission that was appointed to study the issue. Um, I think what, the, what might be pointed out by some is that they weren't given a lot of resources and they haven't been given an extension of time that they requested. My understanding of the resolution is to join in a fairly large number of municipalities that have sent resolutions of this nature to the legislature to sort of continue to try to move the um, football across the goal line, if you will. I uh, apologize for the analogy. But um, because there's not actually a firm action to say this is what we're replacing the current state seal and flag with. It's the fairest articulation I think you can make of it. Yeah. And I note that Mr. Solomon appears to be back on video, but he looks frozen again, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's um, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I am here. I can hear all. Uh, no, we can't, can't hear him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so. Okay. Motion. Yeah. And so, uh, I just would like to ask this one question. You know, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of the goal of this. You know, it's just, I just wonder what, what more, what more we can do. You know, and, and so is it, or is this enough? I mean, so we are potentially combining forces with other municipalities that are doing this thing and is going to put pressure on the legislature to provide more funding to get us to the, um, the point where they, f they finish this, allow the commission to finish its work. Is that what you're understanding, Mr. Hunt? Mr. Chairman, again, I don't want to speak for Mr. Solomon, but my understanding is that um, the commission was charged, its findings aren't necessarily binding um, and they have expressed a need for more time, and at least some folks have expressed the need for more resources to help them finish their work. So th that's my understanding of, of what the continued work um, has been in getting more resolutions of this nature from other cities and towns in the past year or six yeah. months. Right. So it's with respect to the commission as opposed to actually just changing the, um, the seal. It seems like what they really want to do is change the seal regardless of the commission um, is going to do. Because as you said, the commission's um, work is not bi non binding, right? Well, Mr. Chairman, if I may, the commission already recommended changing the flag, seal, and motto, to my understanding. They made that vote, but um, I'm sorry. He, Mr. Solomon by chat says the commission's deadline has ended and their time has not been extended. It's up to the state legislature to take up this issue at this time. It has been two and a half years since the commission's approval. The state of Mississippi changed its flags in six months after George Floyd's death. So I think you've summed that up nicely, Mr. Chairman, that they're looking for additional sort of pressure to move this issue forward um, by having the town of Arlington be added to the communities. And again, I'm trying not to advocate, I'm just trying to read what Mr. Well, yeah, yeah, right. has written here to uh, continue to apply some momentum behind this, this action. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out what more we, we can do in, on this. I mean, we go through the effort in, of, of in taking our time in, and Tom Beatty's time mean to deal with these resolutions and they are good causes me but but if they really aren't doing anything then once again I'm kind of in the situation where I was before it's like me I appreciate the public engagement me and the desire to affect change me but but don't want to just do something for the sake uh, of doing it you know because uh, all right you know well the answer I'm, I'm gonna get on this, and, um, and I'm not frustrated with any of you. It's more just kind of you see me like wrestling with with resolutions. Um, um, 
in public because that's what we do. Uh, so uh, uh, I think uh, probably my comments don't have my colleagues don't have any other questions comments. And so I think on a uh, motion to um, vote positive action on the resolution by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. Behan. Mr. Hein. Are there? Did you already seek public comment? Yes. Oh, I'm, my apologies, Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Diggins. Yes. yes. It's a 4-0 vote with Mr. Helmuth uh, recusing himself. All right. Thank you. And thanks for that double check, Mr. Heim, and to make sure that I had uh, checked me for public comment. Uh, I so, Mr. Chairman. My, my bad. Oh, no, no. I, I express appreciation for that. So the whole point is for you not to apologize. <laughs> so, so, so. All right. Uh, so um, next um, uh, article for a bylaw amendment on medical anti discrimination bylaw. Uh, so I think this is Mr. Catline. Is it? Hello. Hello. Uh, Hi. Oh, Mr. Hi. Mr. Chair, may I address both? of my articles together and in reverse order. It's a little bit easier to explain that way. Um, we'll still have to take votes on them, you know, separately. I mean, it, so, so is it possible for you to, to break them up? Well, I'll tell you what, you go ahead and have discussion and we'll take the vote separately. Okay, you know, so. all right. Yeah, Try to right. keep it short. Uh, I trust you've all read my submitted materials. Um, so my name is Mark Kepline. I'm town meeting member for Precinct 9, and I'm also the newly elected chair of the Arlington Republican Town Committee. We developed these two Warren articles in response to members losing their jobs, pensions, and careers, much like MBTA employees who lost their jobs and contributing to the current shortage of drivers and engineers due to vaccine mandates. So the resolution is resolved that people have a natural and innate authority over their own body. It's uh, short and simple. Uh, it's based on the constitutions of the United States and Massachusetts. And I just learned that there's two similar bills before the legislature for my two articles, SD 2014 and HD 2390. Um, it, and it doesn't necessarily apply absolutely for those below the age of majority or have guardians. So the statement includes reproductive rights, um, that women have the right to terminate pregnancy until the growing baby is recognized as having rights itself. This includes uh, reproductive rights and the number of children a woman may have, making China's one-child rule unacceptable to us includes gender-affirming medicines and surgeries for adults, tattoos, piercings, general surgeries, etc. This also includes whether a person takes or refuses drugs claiming to be safe and effective, including vaccines. This also includes whether a person chooses to wear a medical face mask or not. At the minimum, mandates need to be made by elected board of, boards responsible to voters and not appointed officials, as in Arlington. Authority over one's body means not being forced to wear a medical mask or burqa, as in some countries. Both being demanded for the benefit of others, a mask to keep others safe from COVID, a burqa to protect men from possibility of feeling lust, giving them comfort. I ask for your support in affirming people are born with rights over their own body. Government does not grant rights, but instead must protect the rights people are born with. That is the responsibility of government. My second article is people shall not be denied access to facilities or services based on medical status. It should also be easy. I grew up during the AIDS era when public fear and ignorance resulted in horrible discrimination directed at suffering populations and those suffering horribly. Laws were made to protect medical status information people from discrimination. This is all out the window with COVID. Fear and ignorance returned with vaccination cards and needing them to gain entrance to venues like the senior center or participate in youth sports. Young people face no risk from COVID and are at the highest risk for myocarditis. 
the decision makes no sense. Again, COVID vaccines do not block transmission, yet science was ignored and people clutched fear-based mandates. President Biden said COVID is over. I hope belief in disproven claims by the CDC and others will also end soon. Censorship of newer science must end before healing can begin and victims of bad science are made whole. I respectfully ask the board to protect residents from discrimination based on what medical conditions they have or don't have, so they don't need to produce personal medical files to enjoy facilities and services today and for the next pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> well, we are going to take these um, one at a time. And so the first one is on the uh, amendment, bylaw amendment for medical anti discrimination bylaw. And uh, so uh, I turn to you. So uh, I think before we take the motion or anything, I'll check to see if there are any um, any input from members of the public. There is one hand, a couple hands raised at this time. Okay, you know, so so this is being a resolution. You know, I'm sorry to point this out earlier. We kind of adopt in the same format that we do um, in town meeting, where we take a a one a positive a pro um speech. Mr. Diggins, yes i just I, I i think i know where you're going but i don't want to confuse it i think we're talking about the bylaw first oh right so then it's just a hearing so then we can accept as many so thank you thank you i appreciate that clarification so so we can have as many comments as we want so okay and uh, so please bring first the, one the first person is gina b okay. You would just unmute your mic. I can hear me now, I'm sorry. My name is Michelle. Um, I just wanted to voice my full support for what Mark Kaplan just said. Um, his two, I think one was a bylaw and one's a resolution. Um, something that we can all agree um, is something that we need more of in this world as we've just gone through the most divisive years in history. Um, the first one is the uh, bodily autonomy, right? Either it's my body or my choice or it's not, right? Either you have control over your body or the government does. And I think we all agree we should have that choice. And then the second was, was the anti-discrimination. Um, and yes, of course, there has been mistakes made in the past. Um, actually, a group of concerned citizens, we just met with someone in Arlington leadership who actually did and, and honestly admit that mistakes were made and uh, we need to learn from those mistakes as to not repeat them. So no, uh, any discrimination against someone that has not had a medical procedure should never happen. So I really hope that you consider these and also um, send your support. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person is Paul Schlittman. And just one of my last one being to uh, the bylaw, if you want to respond to the resolution, we'll bring you back. Yeah, thank you. I just want to uh, point out that uh, uh, that the school committee maintained its legal obligations throughout the pandemic. Uh, we did adopt emergency uh, policies that designated certain decisions to the superintendent uh, during the pandemic, which was a common policy uh, to most school committees throughout the state. The intent was because the conditions were changing rapidly, uh, a, an elected body cannot uh, make quick decisions. We can set the parameters for the decisions and then set ourselves up at, with the ability to review or reverse them if we so desire. But the decisions that were made regarding both masking uh, policies and opening school uh, were done through the authority of the school committee. In addition, the decision to require vaccines of extracurricular activities within the district 
were specifically made by a vote of the school committee attached to that uh, temporary um, um, a policy that we enacted during the, the pandemic. Um, it is not uncommon for there to be vaccine mandates uh, put forth by the state. Um, it, and we don't view that as being uh, an unusual uh, part of our work. Uh, for the record, the emergency policies have been rescinded, uh, so they are no longer in effect. But um, the, the statement that decisions were being made by the Board of Health or the superintendent um, and, and not based on the decisions of the school committee and the parameters set by the school committee is, is not really accurate. Thank you. Um, um, I certainly agree with some of the stuff that has been but I mean, I, I'm going to make a motion for vote of no action under the premise that the language to me just seems overly broad and there could be just read on its face. I can't comprehend the full extent of what would be prohibited here and what, what special circumstances we could be changing just by inserting this language. So for those grounds I am voting. Submitting a motion of no action. Thank you. I second that. And I would just add, having reviewed uh, Attorney Himes uh, very helpful memo to the board, which is available to the public on the select board agendas and minutes page, it's very clear that whatever one's views are on the substance, this is an inappropriate, legally inappropriate vehicle. This bylaw, if I am interpreting Attorney Himes, uh, memo correctly can have no effect. It would be immediately ruled, um, rejected by the, by the Attorney General and for very good reasons because it is not within the scope of town meeting's authority to do the things that it enumerates, uh, endeavors to do. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, so, so quick question, quick question. Um, half line. I mean, would there be any exceptions? I mean, um, to your bylaw? I mean, um, where the, the um, state could require, you know, um, um, a requirement? Well, sh sure. Um, I mean, I, it's hard to think of a situation where there should be a, an exception. Um, should people with HIV be excluded from activities? You know, how do you feel about that? Well, I have an answer, so, 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 you know, you, you, or, say that, you say there could be, but you're not sure what they are. Okay, just, just trying to understand, you know, so, all right. right yeah. Well, there's always emergency edicts that mm -hmm. overrule any law, and we've okay. seen that happen. And, and that would so, be, so you, that's acceptable? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, okay. if, if um, there's an Ebola outbreak and um, people need to, uh, stay clear of infected mm -hmm. people, then right. certainly. Um, but in this case, um, you know, mandating masks and vaccines that ha are now shown right. ineffective in, right. in the least, most recent science, um, you. you know, they're unreasonable. All right, gotcha. So thanks, well, that was helpful, you know, so. All right, you know, so um, any other comments, questions? Okay, okay. So, so, um, well, I appreciate, you know, the, the, um, your answer. I mean, it's a good answer, but because of that understanding about the exceptions, it does make it easy for me to, um, for no action on this. So, so, um, with that, I mean, um, we have a motion on no action for Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. Helmet and, um, Mr. Heim. Thank you. Just to be clear, the board is voting on the proposed, uh, bylaw amendment. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mrs., uh, Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. yes. Sam Great. 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 So now we're taking up the, the, the resolution, my body, uh, my choice resolution. So, so um, any um, comments, questions? Motion, motion, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Helmuth. 
Mr. Helmut? Did we, are we doing um, public comments for this first before you do motions? Or, or is that period finished for both of us? Well, I, you know, if you want to do the motion now, um, no. that's fine. I mean, and, and then I am going to do public comment, but yeah, yeah, I kind no, of no, leave my, it. My, I'm sorry, I just, I was, it's, it's late. My practice yes, is always, always to listen to the public before I make a motion, so. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't, you know, it's fine to wait until the, the public chimes in. It's just I didn't want to limit what you do um, now in this period. So uh, give me public um, comments, questions, uh, motions. So. I'm seeing nothing from my colleagues at this point. So we'll look to the public, see if there's any statements. In this case, we'll take one. Gina B has her hand raised. Okay, you know, I think, so since this is a resolution meeting, we've heard from her before saying that she was gonna be in support of this meeting. So the way we're gonna handle the resolution, I was about to say this earlier, but we, um, we stopped in the middle of it, is that uh, we're gonna handle the resolutions like we do in town meeting that we take in, a uh, pro-side and uh, uh, anti-side meet up. And so, so um, Ms. B, Ms. Trina B, I mean, if this is against the resolution, we'll hear you, but if it's for it, we won't. No, it's absolutely for it. Okay. And and I what I, I, you know, just one comment. Sure. So they all talked about the Alwife project, which is amazing, right? Absolutely disgusting wastewater is going in and killing the fish. But we look at this, which is actually hurting and has hurt people and children, but we're right. not going to take action on that. I just find that astounding. I got you. Okay, I appreciate that. You know, so um, questions, comments, motions from our colleagues? Please help me out. We have no action. I'll, I'll second the motion. It sometimes with these resolutions, it gets kind of funky because I mean, I agree with the premise of the what the article is saying, the wording. But I mean, I think this is sort of similar to what um, the chair said with previous articles is, you know, I'm not sure where at some point with these resolutions, I'm the explosion of re resolutions that we've had in the past couple of years, we have to really figure out if what, you know, we're accomplishing anything with the resolution, if the resolution is doing something. And uh, while I agree, again, I agree with the wording, I just don't, I think we should continually be supporting resolutions that really don't push anything on the back end. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. So, look, I mean, I think we run into the the same issues we that we did with with the bylaw on on this one, and and and, and I mean, ultimately, ultimately, the Constitution takes care of all of this. I mean, and any limitations I mean uh, that we see are generally coming I mean, from. Um, from bodies I mean, that can be challenged I mean, uh, in the courts. I mean, so I mean, this is not going to get you anything that you don't already, already have I mean, in our system of government. You know? and so so um, um, it, it's, um, it's your right to make these resolutions. It's your right to use our time this way. It's your right you know, to I mean, uh, take I mean, whatever we vote on create a substitute motion to take more Tom Meany's time, you know, but I don't think it'll benefit anyone, but you're right. So, um, um, so on, uh, Mr. Chair, could I, um, yeah, is, I'm just very briefly, I'm, I'm just so hesitant on the fence about saying this, but, um, it, it's, I, I'll, I'll be voting no action. But I t sort of think case in point, if, um, you're a guardian of a family member that for whatever reason um, you as the guardian has to uh, be the person who oversees, similar to a health proxy, um, that individual um, for whatever uh, developmental delay or, uh, and I don't want to go into it too much because I'm not trying to make light or 
I, I think you understand what I'm saying. Um, this would really uh, go against that because I, I do know of some individuals that um, it could be someone that really isn't that even verbal and, and just says no all the time. Um, and something like this uh, could preclude. Uh, and, but I'll stop there. I'm, I'm getting too into it. So, um, but I, I do see a case in point where, unfortunately, because of uh, some individuals, um, this could be something that would not be to their benefit and could be harmful. Thank you. So, so, um, so generally, um, Mr. Kaplan, let's say we, we're treating this like we do uh, the, the resolutions in, in town meeting where we're just doing one statement for and one well, statement against. I wanted to clarify. Okay. Um, so the statement would ap apply to adults, um, you know, so they're above the age of consent. So naturally, you wouldn't have children deciding on their own to change their gender or get an abortion without their parental, parental knowledge and consent. For example, um, so and then the same thing applies for people who have appointed guardians. Again, the guardian then has legal responsibility for that person. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. So, um, any other comments, questions? All right. All right. You know, so, I think we will trust the date here. So, on a vote of no action by Mr. Helmut and a second. Uh, by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourse. Yes. yes. Mr. Helm. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you, Mr. Kaplan. Good night. Hi, thank you. Here. Welcome. So, uh, so we have one more to dispose of. I understand that uh, this uh, article has been withdrawn as a vote to establishment of a civic participation, civic participation study group. So, Motion for vote no action. Second. All right. No need for discussion. So, so um, I want to vote of no action by Mr. Hurd and yes. second by Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Heim. Mr. Diggins, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure, since we've been following this practice, that we, if there's any public comment, I know it's the petitioner has asked for the withdrawal of the article in writing, but I just want to double check. No problem, Mr. Hunt. That's why you're here to keep us in order. You know. So thank you. Any 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 input? At this time, there are no hands raised. Okay. Great. So so can I pick up where we were, Mr. Hunt? So we have the motion um, to, um, of no action by Mr. Helmuth and a second by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd. Close enough. Yes. <laughs> Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Uh, Mr. Helm. Who am I? <laughs> yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, for everyone. Mr. Diggins. Yes. yes. It's unanimous vote. Well, I thought I had it right. I thought that's why I did the first time. You know, maybe it's, you know so, um, all righty. So uh, we are on to updates. Overnight parking pilot. Uh, so, so, um, so you, I, I sent you all the link made to the video made, uh, of the um, of the park, the forum that Mr. DeCourcy and I, and actually Mr. Helmet. So it was actually a special select board meeting, you know, and and uh, it was you know a good two plus hours of um, interaction with residents about uh, the the issue, you know, and so uh, as uh, Mr. DeCourcy and I. Reiterated and Mr. Helmut too um, at the meeting that this was we were not coming to residents with a done deal and, uh, uh, and that we were going to um, certainly take their comments and questions you know, uh, to heart you know, and, and think about them before moving forward. So I met with Mr. Corsi, I uh, talked with Mr. Corsi afterwards, I mean, and we certainly had some more. Um, thinking and work to do before coming back uh, to the board with a proposal. Uh, and so we will, the earliest we'll do that is next meeting. I mean, uh, but at this point, we just want to check me in with you uh, to see if you have any thoughts and feelings. But before I turn it over to you, I'll ask Mr. Corsi if he wants to say a few words. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, that was, that was well said. I, I guess just one thing, and, and you always learn different facets of, of what's being proposed in those 
a lot of comments that, that, that are, are going to um, require us to go back and think things through before we come back to the board. But one thing, and, and related to overnight parking, but a little bit outside that, that came through at that meeting was, was really the, the, the need for, that the, or the struggles people have with guest parking in town. And there were several people who spoke up at that meeting, and, and that's something that maybe you and I will think about some more in terms of how that gets incorporated as well. But I, I, as I said at that forum, I thank everybody for the comments, and um, there was a number of people opposed to it, and there, there were people who were in favor of it as well, but uh, the comments were all constructive, and we appreciate the input. Um, any other comments? Questions? Yeah, well, I'll just add to it. I mean, yeah, I, I was really impressed with how well, you know, uh, people um, um, conducted themselves being at the forum. I mean, you know, I mean, any, any forum can get a uh, little heated, you know, especially when people care a lot of, about a topic, you know, and that was, was not the case here. Everyone was, was, was very, very respectful. And, and so I, I, I very much enjoyed them listening to them. I mean, I did more listening, you know, than, than countering points. I mean, there were certainly some things um, people said to I me mean, every once in a while I would give a thought, I mean, or a counterpoint on something. Uh, but but it's really good to uh, hear the input. And I, I'm pretty sure where we are landing on this, I mean, is that I mean, it'll be an increase, I mean, in, um, the allowance I mean, for permitted overnight parking. And I only say that uh, because it may very well be that when Mr. DeCourcy and I come back um, with a proposal, it'll have a little bit of a different name, you know, because I think I mean, uh, we, we use the term pilot because that was the term that we started using when, when um, it came before us in 21 as an article. Uh, that we would go and, and examine I mean, what we could do. And I think we just kind of settled on the word pilot. For us, it was more I mean, I mean, just trying I mean, um, to change things. I mean, and it was a shortcut, but uh, I think it gave a little more, a lot more um, breadth um, to, uh, or in, in a larger scale um, to what um, our intent is. And so, so, um, so that's it. So unless there's any questions. More comments or anything, uh, we'll move on to the next issue. Next item. All right, rolling along here. You know, so, correspondence received. Uh, we have traffic concerns on Gray Street by Joe Greenlee, 24 Windermere Avenue, and Claudia Madison, 17 Gray Street. Uh, we have inspection improvements at Church Hill Ave, Indicott Road, and Gloucester Street. Uh, David Brigden, 25 Indicott Street and some more support and opposition um, letters regarding potential overnight parking pilot uh, by Lori Leahy, Mark Dipsy, and, and I think we have a letter in there from uh, Scott Smith. Uh, Mr. Hearn. Move receipt and referral of 17 and 18 to TAC, which I assume just gets bunched with our previous referrals, and just, I think, move receipt of 19. In referral to our overnight parking subcommittee. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. The hardest working committee on the select board. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a motion. Go ahead, Mr. Helms. Make a challenge for me. Go ahead. Just second. Deprived. Second by second. Opportunity. <laughs> a second by Mr. Corsi. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, any other comments, questions? All righty. So, on a uh, motion to move receipt and referral to attack on uh, 17, 16 to 17, you know, by Mr. Hurt, actually, sorry, and then a uh, uh, referral to the overnight parking pilot committee for number 18 by Mr. Hurt, and second by Mr. Corsi. Mr. Hein. Mr. Hurt. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helmut? Yes. Mrs. Milan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Mr. Great. Great. And so we come to new business, you know, with 13 minutes to go. So um, Ms. Meyer? No new business. Thank you. 
Mr. Hein? No, no business, thank you. Mr. Kohler? A report very quickly that we got our state aid figures in from the governor's budget. Um, they were up substantially from what our original estimates were. We originally thought there'd be $750,000 in state aid. And additional state aid, there, there's close to three, uh, three million. Mm -hmm. that, wow. That's right, yes. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. <laughs> it's late. <laughs> um, this will be considered by the uh, Long Range Planning Committee at their meeting on uh, the 10th. Uh, and I think shortly thereafter, there will be a recommendation back to the board for consideration of whether to have an override this spring. And that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Pooler. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly, and thank you, Mr. Pooler, for, for, for that update. Um, well, it's that time of year for high school sports and tournament time, and I usually give a little update on that. So at, at Arlington High, Boys hockey is playing this Thursday against Westford Academy in the first round. Girls hockey is playing Wednesday night at 6 at the Ed Burns Arena against Beverly. While you were all talking about Appleton Street, I was in the back room watching the boys basketball game, and unfortunately, they lost at the buzzer tonight oh. in the first round to Reading, 45 Redding, to 44. Right. So yeah. congratulations to them for making the tournament, but uh, a tough loss, and, and, and good luck to all the uh, tournament teams. Okay, thank you, Mr. Corsi. So to break up the sports new business, I'm going to skip this behind and go to Mr. Hurd. Actually, no, that I may still have that issue, so I'll go to Mr. Mr. Hellman. No new business. Mr. Hurd. I have sports new business, too, <laughs> at a much lower level. I just want to congratulate two Arlington youth hockey teams for winning the state tournament this weekend. One was the Pee Wee AAA team which I do not have a connection to. And one was the Squirt AA team, which I do have a connection to. Um, that's Wesley's team. They went out to the Lovell Arena today, uh, this weekend, and they won in overtime. Nice. They scored a goal about five minutes into overtime against Hanover. So it was quite an exciting day for them. And so is a possibility of a state championship banner with my name on it hanging next to one with Wesley's name on it. I might need to talk to the rec department to see if we can rearrange some banners. <laughs> Not to um, exert any undue influence. But no, it, it was, I just wanted to congratulate those two teams because it is a, uh, it's, a not, it's no small feat for them. And certainly at that age, they've never experienced that before. So they're quite excited. Thank you. No, that's great, great news. Um, this is Mahan. No new sports for <laughs> any other business. Great. Well, thank you. So, so, um, so, uh, I was thinking that Mr. Hurt uh, might mention um, a little something about beautification, you know. But, but, um, so, um, I, he and I are probably going to work some more. I mean, on the whole um, beautification committee thing. I mean, and uh, maybe have. Um, so have to discuss at the next meeting. You know, this. Yeah, I, I think we'll put an agenda item, a brief agenda item, just for a recommendation for some changes to the. This is originally a beautification committee that we're trying to get going, and oh, beautification! It's a, it's a little it's a communication. It's a, right it's a little limited to to what the slots were originally put on it, so that will be forthcoming. All right. Great. So. So um, that's it for me. So um, on that, you know, I will motion take a motion. to adjourn. Second. All right. So I motion to adjourn by Mr. Hurd and second by Mr. Corsi. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Yes, please. Yes. See you all next week. Good job.